Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Tyvis Powell, Jason Lloyd. Plus, da 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 da, you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! Hey, welcome everybody, Anthony's here too. Erlin for G. Who knows what's happening with G? I don't know. I never know what's happening. With G There's called it. something going on. He called me this morning at 10.15. G will be here, hopefully, at some point. He's supposed to be in the middle chair. Earl's going to Let's be go. honest. Earl does not want G to come here because he wants to stay on the set. The I mean, the emphasis on we never know with G, right? You never know. 10 minutes. It he, could be an hour. G might walk in here at 12.50 and try to mic up. That's true. He told he me could. he had just got his car fixed. Yeah. First day driving his his, was it Range Rover? Whatever he yeah. drives. Yeah. He got the G Bush license. Oh, he just got it fixed and then it broke Just down got it again. fixed. His first drive into work with the fixed car. Yeah. It broke down on East 14th and he's waiting on a tow truck. You know what I told him? <laughs> Chevy gang over everything. Mm-hmm. Them foreign cars, man. The maintenance on them is real. I, you know, I got a Nissan for the first time. I, got I love my Finder, Nissan. And it's great. I'm a I've big had fan. no problems with it whatsoever. I mean, it's a new car. I'm leasing it, but. Subaru sports. gang. Like I love my cross track. Subarus. I had until I, I got it. this Pathfinder, I had had Subarus for about eight years, and I love Subarus. They're great. Except when I went to get this car, and I really like the Pathfinder, but uh, Subarus were hard to get at that time. When I was looking for another car, I bought so. the last one off the truck when I got mine when we started this. Yeah, show. it's hard. I bought a we bought a, a Subaru for my wife, but my I like to lease and get a new car every couple of years. It's probably not a financially savvy move, but I just like having a new car every few years. So I do it. Live your best life. So G will be here at some point. We at hope. some point, yes. We but. got uh, so we're a little uh, short-staffed at the moment. Usually <laughs> we have four people behind the glass. Today we only have two because Earl and Mike are both on the panel. Anthony behind the glass. Steve, of of course, uh, very talkative as usual back there. So uh, not that I would know. I got in last second, which is a bad job of me. I don't like to come in last second. It's not that common, but I did. Anyway, it is what it is. We got a lot to get to today. Uh, we know the, the game times and the dates for the, for the Cavs playoffs. Uh, we're going to get plenty into the Guardians later this hour. A great win by the Guardians, who have the best record in baseball right now as we wake up this morning. Or, yeah, it's still morning. And, uh, and, of course, we'll talk about the Browns. Kevin Stefanski spoke about Deshaun Watson. We'll talk a little bit about the offense. And Zach Jackson joins us at noon from The Athletic. We'll get his take on what the Browns might do in the draft. And plenty of other things. Guys, how are you? Doing Great, well. man. Great. It's a good morning. Yeah. Nice Wednesday. I love the whole overcast, misty rain when the when the weather is decent. It's supposed to storm tonight, though. Which is, you know, I love thunderstorms, though. Thunderstorms is the I best. It's finally it's warm. Finally Look nice. Out. I, I don't want a storm. Be Look warm. That. That's peaceful right there. Well, man. it's nice. You know, when it's 70 degrees and cloudy, that's the best driving weather, too. Yeah. And it's good walking <clears> weather. You know, you don't have to worry about the sunglasses, any of that nonsense. I do want to start uh, with something that, so yesterday on the show, I made, I ripped into the Browns uh, for doing these one day, uh, I don't know why I'm doing in air quotes, because they're actually doing a one day contract with, um, with, uh, with Christian two Kersey players. and Richard Higgins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Couldn't think of their names for a second. And not surprisingly... A lot of people were pissed at what I said. Well, I guess it's a little surprising they were pissed. But not surprisingly, people disagreed with what I said. So, I'll be honest. Normally, as you know, I don't care when there's reaction. I don't really respond to it uh, in terms of changing my, my mind. But I, I, feel, I take pride in being someone that, unlike a lot of people in this business, is not afraid to admit when he's wrong. So, I, I, so last night, I went and I watched all the the videos that the Browns put out with Kirksey and with Higgins. And then I rewatched what I said because Mike po- or one of you guys posted it on our on our Twitter page. So I rewatched what I said and and after and I rewatched it after I had watched the uh, Browns videos and I thought to myself, you know, I'm wrong here. Uh, I I in general, I think the I think the one day contracts in general are a silly thing and don't make much sense. And because of that, I turned, for whatever reason, I turned it into something more. 
Uh, and, you know, twice in this week I've been accused of uh, sensationalism or just saying things to get people angry. And I was, I admitted yesterday with, the, with my Cavs comments the other day, although I stand by exactly what I said with the Cavs, I egged it up a little to, to you know, poke a little bit. But I really don't do that. And I take pride in my, in my uh, being non-biased. We're, we all have some biases. But I take a lot of pride in not allowing my fandom or not allowing fans to be on my side to, to influence my opinion. And sometimes when you do that, you piss people off. Mike tweeted, I piss a lot of people off, which I do, and I know that. And I'm okay with that because... I say things that are true to me. And, but I realized that, I, I, that yesterday that I went a little further on those comments than I should have. And I think it was a kind of a carryover of what I said about the Cavs. And I was in this mode. Of you, were just, hot. you were hot yesterday. I'm just shitting on the Browns. You came in hot yesterday. Not shitting too. on the Browns, but shitting on the Cavs because I'm. And, and part of the reason I'm shitting on the Cavs is because I'm just so aggravated by how they played. And because I didn't grow up rooting for the Cavs. People take that sometimes as, oh, you're a hater. No, I want, I, I'm not saying I'm a diehard fan like people that grew up rooting for him, but I was super excited when the Cavs won the championship. I want the Cavs to win, and I do this with my, with my own teams, folks. If you, if you hear me in my private life talk about the Cubs and the Bengals when they're not good, which for my life has mo- mostly been the case for both teams, I shit on those teams all the time. We just don't talk about it here because if I talk about the Cubs or Bengals too much, then people are going to be like, why are you talking about the Cubs and Bengals? Nobody cares. But that's just how I am with my teams. I shit on them when they do things I don't like. But I thought about this specific thing with the Browns, and I have crapped on the Browns quite a bit over the years. I think I've been mostly complimentary to them the last couple of years. But I've crapped on the Browns, and I think every time I – or almost every time I have, it's been completely fair. And I, like I said, I take a lot of pride in my credibility as a broadcaster, and, and some people will laugh at that, and, but it's important to me, and I care about that. And so after, after watching it again and after watching what I said, I thought I was way, I was too far, way far over the top. It's really not a big deal. And it was a, it was, it was a good moment for those guys. And, and who am I to begrudge them that moment and Browns fans who care about their players? And that's one of the things I love so much about Cleveland, even though it leads me to roll my eyes sometimes when people say they'd rather have Jerry Judy over, uh, who was it? Devonta Smith. Devonta Smith, right? Sometimes it makes me roll my eyes. But that's why Cleveland <clears throat> is great. That's why I moved here. That's why I live here. And that's why I have no plans to go anywhere else because of the passion of the fan base and the fact that I think I've met eight people in 13 years here that don't like sports. And, and that's what's great about it. So I, I, so I poo-pooed something and I was angry about something when, as you said, I came in hot yesterday and I, I, I let my misery about some other things and the fact that I don't like the one-day con- one contracts make way bigger deal than it should have been. So I retract my statement uh, and I'm perfectly fine with what the Browns did, and I, I feel a little bad that I poo-pooed it, especially because I did like Christian Kirksey when he was here. He was always very nice to me, and so was Rashard Higgins. And just to be in the NFL, I know I'm rambling at this point, but just to be in the NFL and play in the NFL for as long as they, they, those guys did is a great accomplishment. And sometimes when you're talking about sports for 25 years, you sometimes forget that, and you got to remind yourself of those things. The reason I got into this in the first place uh, is, is, is not to be a big shot. It's because I loved sports and I loved the guys that play sports. And that always meant something to me. And sometimes you forget that. So I'm sorry for rambling so much, but I wanted to get all that out. Well, just like every good character arc story bowl, you yeah. have a chance for redemption today. That's right. The Browns also, as they did yesterday morning, yeah. made another giant announcement this morning that I'm going to ask you your opinion on first. And a chance of redemption. You were not necessarily Wouldn't it be funny if I like crushed the Browns now for this. <laughs> it would be it would be ironically <laughs> funny. But the Browns are yeah. officially bringing back the white face masks. It is official. Yeah. The logo hasn't changed. This is the debut video they tweeted out. Nick Chubb was the poster boy for the white face mask, which will debut again in 2024. And it's a subtle change to their overall aesthetic. But Bull, are you yeah. a fan of the white face mask 
coming back in 2024. I have, I will admit, I am. Now, I swear I'm not saying this because I'm, <laughs> because I don't want anybody to get mad at me today. I don't care. I'll probably say something that gets you all mad at me later. But I do, but I do like the white helmet, the white face mask. Yes. So uh, I, I know he tried to move on, but yeah. I just wanted to give you your roses for actually coming out, you know, taking accountability, manning up and coming on this platform and speaking truth to light about your comments, man. Me and you have had conversations um, in the past about things said and unsaid. I've learned a lot from you since I've been in this game. We had the conversation earlier today. I think that uh, just just kudos to you on that. Thank, so, you. So, Thank, you. Thank you. What do you think of the white face mask, Harold? Yeah, I, I think they dope. I love the white face mask. I play a lot of Madden. You got the option to go re- wear the v white face mask on Madden. Yeah. Every uniform alternate that I put the brows in, I go with the white face mask. I think uh, it's a nod to tradition. The brown face mask was cool f- for why they mm-hmm. lasted, but they really didn't pop like that. But uh, when you seen, like, I think it was, what, two seasons ago when we played the Baltimore Ravens, Deshaun Watson led us to victory, and you seen him out there doing a bow and arrow with the orange pants, brown jersey, yeah. orange helmet with the white face mask. I thought that was fire. So I like the Browns uniform combinations. They finally got everything right. Don't touch it no more. The white face mask pops, and especially in night games, under the yeah, bright lights, look particularly it good. stands out and looks phenomenal in ways that just – in ways a gray face mask or a dark face mask does it. It just pops. It's an aesthetic, just like the white uniforms last year. I don't want to bring up the Steelers game. It wasn't a bad result, and obviously what happened to Nick Chubb was terrible, but from an aesthetic standpoint, the Jets game, much better Thank example. Thank you. I was about the Jets to say. game, much better. <laughs> How beautiful were those jerseys underneath the dark sky, the yeah. bright lights? A, it pops, and it looks like G. Bush is here. There he it is. It pops. It works. It accents the details of the rest of the uniform. And I always stand by this, and Jeek will tell you in a sec. You run faster in white shoes than you do in black shoes. White cleats, you run faster. In basketball, you jump higher in non-dark colored shoes. None of that is true. It is true. It's all mental. Look good, play good, Is this a white forces versus black forces conversation? I don't know what the effect in football that the white face mask will have versus a darker face mask, but it has to do something. But you're the reason Tyreek Hill don't wear black shoes. We need uh, to find out the Browns' all-time record in the history of the franchise when wearing white face masks. I do got a question before, uh, for y'all both before Shoot. I exit. What's your favorite Browns uniform combination? The one they just showed Nick Chubb taking the handoff in a second ago. Orange pants, brown jersey, the traditional helmet with the white face mask. Oh, yeah, I love and I like the orange socks with it, too. I love the orange pants. The orange pants is my favorite. I love the dark colored jerseys. I would agree with that. I don't like the, uh, I don't like the all white. I hate the all white. I hate the all white. You mean the one they played in last year? No, no. Like a couple of years ago in Board yes. Notice, yeah. they had a season to where they wore the white pants, white jerseys with and this is when they had the gray face mask. Right. With that the, the with the orange helmets and gray that, that, face that, that, masks. That would not they good. wore that no. for sixteen straight games. Yeah. And that was absolutely horrible. I think like, the orange pants look the best. I do too. Yeah. I would Although, love to have the orange jerseys again though. Yeah, have they? When's the last time they? Well, those were the co- NFL got into the color rush phase. Wasn't yeah. that their color rush? No, their color rush was like the all brown without the stripes. Oh yeah, and that it was... had orange lettering on the color. Yeah, rush. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, remember, know, I remember that. I had to on Friday. We were doing like this past Friday. Did you guys end up doing that thing? Because I had gifts. We had all sent in our logos. Yeah, we did. People hated your helmet. They hated mine. Oh, they we hated tore yours, yours apart. Oh. It's our most viewed clip of the month, though. <laughs> Why was the worst helmet ever? Yeah, in people very did not like your helmet. It was like you know, super gremlin. Now, G didn't, G didn't send in a helmet, so we yeah. just gave him yours, and oh. he almost puked on air seeing it. G, that, oh, man. I never gave the elf more color like you, know, you asked, so. I dropped the ball on that because it shouldn't have been the elf. I should have come up with something else, but I wanted something that was, like, totally out of the norm, different colors to wear, yeah. like, once in a blue moon. I went I 80s. I, I went with the brown, yeah. with the uh, orange browns script. On, on the helmet, you know, kind of pay homage to, to the Schottenheimer days. Yeah. Anthony you know. went with Parma, white helmet, pink flamingo. Yeah. I had That's, a, mine was worse than that? Hey. A pink flamingo? Yeah. People hated yours. I'm telling you. Like, worse than a pin, pink maybe flamingo? Maybe he saw it. That's why he took a shot at Parma yesterday. You went lying. Bull came in hot. Yeah. Bull, Bull came in very yeah. hot yesterday. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how it's worse than a pink flamingo, but. Do you believe uh, there's any whatever. credence to. Look good, play good, though, and then we'll get G in here in one yeah, second. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that was... Come on, that's better than mine? Yours yeah. is bad. Yeah. Come on, G. I put more work into mine than I put into yours, sorry. I don't <laughs> <laughs> that, look like, that looks like a, 
uh, the fourth grade girl's softball helmet. That could have been a Miami Vice joint. Right that's true. All right, we'll get you out of here on this. Picture of FanDuel read here. No, that's the, the, listen to this one. That was mine. Listen to this one. Okay. Can I tell them a pause moment? I don't care, yeah. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> Go back. I'm going to take you behind the glass. Oh, behind yeah. the glass episode coming next week, by the way, right? Yeah. So we're sitting in the office, and is doing his thing, putting the helmets together. Yeah. He says, Mike, I got a hard time having the arms lift up your Polish boy on the helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh like, my God! <laughs> Sometimes you just can't lift it up, you know. Oh man! Hey, shout out to Phil Bowman who gifted five memberships. By the way, man, Phil gifted I think five, five yesterday, yesterday too. Yeah, well. shout out to Phil. So shout out to y'all, man. I'm out of here. That is awful. Yeah, that's that's terrible. But but like, it's not my fault. He put that terrible. Uh, I had to call. But I will say, and I know you guys will agree with me here. I would like it if the Browns had the mat helmets. Are you with me on that? Yeah. The mat, yeah, the mat would look good. No, not in that color, but a. Traditional Browns helmet with some yeah, that is matte pretty, coloring. That is awful. I agree. I don't know what I was thinking. You know, it was a rough weekend for me. You can put the Bengal stripes on there, which, you I, know, your subconscious was coming out. Did I say stripes? Yeah. I didn't even remember saying it. This weekend was crazy for me. My son was, like, puking and... Oh, yeah, you weren't here for He was a forgot, mess yeah. all weekend. It started Thursday night. And uh, I think it affected my brain, G. Bush. <laughs> Boo, Boo had the internet on fire. I know. Oh my <laughs> he God. had the internet going crazy. You, 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 you missed my... Uh... You, don't, you don't need the IFP today. We don't have no guests. Oh, good. Are we good here? What do you mean? Oh, Zach's in studio? Zach's coming in, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, you missed my 10-minute... Uh, my uh, apology. Sort of apology. Oh, that's good, man. That's, yeah. that's, that's good, man. You know, you came back through and, you know... I was too hard on the Browns. Everybody, everybody got, you know, some, everybody got I, I get, Today's my redemption story. Redemption right. story. Yeah. And let's get a read in. Let's ahead, get to Deshaun Watson, Kevin Stefanski, and some yeah, other stuff. Yeah, let's do it here, guys. Uh, it's playoff time in the NBA, NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, good. new customers get $150 oh, in bonus here. bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on the app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you guys waiting for? You just have to visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, guys. So yesterday, Kevin Stefanski spoke as the Browns gathered for OTAs for the first time in the offseason. He, uh, he had plenty of things to say. Deshaun Watson spoke as well. Uh, do we have some of the quotes posted on, you know, on tweets from Deshaun Watson? Yeah, Sean Watson's start. comments were a little confusing. I thought, before we get the quotes, can yeah. I just get, so I'm not a medical yeah. professional. None of us are, obviously. Yes. And I listened well, to the. Well, Aaron pre- Rodgers isn't either, but he talks as if he's a medical I professional. I listened to the press conference <laughs> and came away thinking yes. one thing. Then I saw a couple of tweets that, I was like, I didn't necessarily hear it that way. Right. So, and I think I that's a tweet confused. we're going to re- refer to. So let me give you my thoughts first. Then Go we'll ahead. get to the tweets and see if we come to the conclusion. Yeah. Deshaun said, quote, he's throwing full speed. Yeah. There's no hinges in his release. Yeah. His motion's exactly the same. He's throwing between 40 and 60 balls a day, whatever his doctor's prescribing. Right. That all sounded good. Mm -hmm. Velocity. Someone asked, can you let it rip? He said, yeah, "Yeah, I feel good letting it rip. Yeah. I heard that and I was like, that sounds like steady progress on a linear path towards Deshaun being ready for week one of the NFL season. Actually sounded better than I even thought at this point. So I I had a very positive outcome when I listened to Deshaun. And I said, good, this is steady, gradual progress towards being ready, whether it's OTA's training camp. He looks like he's on a linear progression up. Right. And I felt very good about that. In addition to what he said at lefties, where he said he expected to be, be week ready. one. Exactly. So it was all lining up. It, yeah. all, it all came together. Right. And then I saw a couple of tweets. And the Tom Withers one, I think, is the one you're referring to. Right. Where he said he left more confused than ever. So I went back and I listened to it again yeah. to see if, okay, did I hear something wrong? And I'm choosing to believe Deshaun on this because he's been consistent. And obviously, he knows more than any of us could ever imagine in, in this circumstance. Nothing he said made me more confused other than when he got hurt in the first place, whether it was Tennessee, potentially. But didn't potentially. he say something like he, he could be ready for the first week, but he might not be ready? Or it's gonna ta- I can't remember exactly the words he said. That's why I wanted to see the quotes. But. Well, he said he's on the prescribed schedule and everything yeah. on the schedule that his doctor, is it Alafonte? Right. Well, I forget Ella the doctor. Ella Trash, excuse yeah. me. Everything yeah, that took, he's asked, yeah. he's, been, he's been hitting the, the check marks and progressing at the rate he's supposed right. 
So based on that, I listened twice. I didn't get the confusion other yeah. than when did the injury actually occur. So Which I think that's a major doesn't positive. Really matter, does it makes it? no difference. No, I he's, mean he said that the was ma- there was, something was made of that yesterday. And yeah, you want to like for his own edification. I'm sure he wants to know when it happened and was there some sort of misdiagnosis along the way. But at this point, it's irrelevant. When it happened no. doesn't really matter. So I don't know if that's how you, you guys took it as well, but I took yeah. it as gradual steps in the right direction for Deshaun to be Yeah, healthy. overall it seemed positive. I was just a little – there was one quote, now I can't remember exactly what he said now, that I found a little confusing. But most of what he said sounded like a positive update. Bull, Sorry. are you referring to this one real quick? Uh, Let me see. You can take this, Steve. Watson said there is no timeline for him to be 100%. Could be sooner than later. It could be later than sooner. That was it. That was the quote. That, I was confused by that quote. I took that as just, we'll see if it's 100% yeah, by right, yeah. mid-June. Maybe yeah. it's late June. Like, there wasn't a specific August 3rd, I'm going to be 100%, and if I'm not, it's a back. I, I yeah. didn't look too much into that. I guess we should just ignore that comment because mo- everything else he said was positive. Maybe he kind of misspoke on the way he said I don't know. Or maybe, I, maybe, it does, maybe uh, we're – or I'm thinking it means something when it really doesn't mean anything. I, I don't know. I think I think um, one of the things that they want to work with is messaging. Um, when he got hurt last year, one of the things that we looked at was that was a mess. You know, he would say some team would say something. He yeah. would say some team would say something. And one of the things Coach Stefanski always wants to, you know, you know, lean on is, hey, let's be let's be don't be over the top when we talking. Let's just right. make sure that we just give we gonna give him some information, but we're not gonna give him everything. So, you know, he probably have, has conversations with Deshaun because, in my opinion, I think Deshaun is ready. I think, to me, this is the best he's looked at, and in, in not just physically, but mentally, his energy level um, and just the way he's talking. He seems to be more um, like his, his normal self. However, Coach Stefanski wants to make sure, like, hey, look, we want to get you to the season. Um, we don't want to, you know, have people – you know, jumping off the roofs and different things like that. Let's just be even killed in the way we talk about it. And so I think he he has conversations with Deshaun about messaging because that's a big thing for Kevin Stefanski, and rightfully so. And I think the better that Deshaun, you know, gets at his messaging in terms of talking, I think the more it'll it'll have people feeling confident because I I like the fact that he was out there talking by himself. Yeah, um... He, I agree. He seems more. He seems finally at ease with talking with the media. Now, part of that is nobody's asking him questions about the off-the-field stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's old news at this point. There's nothing left to ask. And I think he, plus, he's probably gotten to know the beat reporters now. He's probably let at least some of them in a little bit. And nobody's out to get him, or at least I don't think anybody's out to get him. And he seems more at ease. Now, maybe maybe internally he's not. I don't know. But I agree with your assessment. I think he's more comfortable speaking to the media because he was always a good talker, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in the pre-off-the-field stuff days with Houston. And so, you know, now that he's, he's been here a couple of years, he's getting more comfortable with the media members here. He's getting more comfortable with being in Cleveland. And now, honestly, guys, he needs to take ownership of this team. Yeah. It's his team. Mm-hmm. If the Browns are going to get to where we want them to get, it's got to be his team. It can't be Miles Garrett's team. It can't be Nick Chubb's, t- Nick Chubb's team. Yeah. It's got to be yeah. Deshaun Watson's team. He's got to be the man. And he alluded to that in different parts of his press conference yesterday. He once again said there's no excuses. I fully right. expect to be back. Yeah, and yeah. at 100% back yeah. to who I was prior to all the injuries off-field stuff. He, someone asked, you know, is there mental hurdles to get over? He said, no, I'm good. I mean, he's setting himself up in the right way to have a very successful and fruitful 2024 season. He's saying all the right things, yeah. which is not 100% translatable. You could say the right things and then not actually do sure. them and Absolutely. not play up the standard, but yeah. you'd much rather hear him go into the season with the right mindset. He's feeling confident. He sounds confident. He knows – I do think, to your point, he knows exactly what he needs – to be for this team to reach their ultimate level right. and their ultimate destinations. There's yeah. no more question marks. It is, Deshaun, if we're going to reach the Super Bowl, if we're going to reach these, these heights that we believe this roster is capable of doing, you got to be the guy that we thought you were. And he feels, to me at least, that he's embraced that and understands the role yeah. that he's stepping into in 2024 yeah, as the quarterback of this team. The Browns have a roster that is a playoff caliber roster. If Deshaun Watson plays like a pro bowler, they have a Super Bowl caliber roster. 
Fact. So it, it's really up to him. Obviously, the other guy's got to perform and you got to have health and all these things. But what takes them from a playoff team to a Super Bowl team is Deshaun Watson. It's really that simple. So, and he knows that. He knows that. He's got to be the man. He I think, was the man in Houston. He's got to be the man here now. You know, I was, I, you know, I was watching, um, and you know, kind of with baseball. I, you know, been watching a lot of softball and baseball the last couple of days, and they are so right when you talk about baseball. Is the fact that sometimes you just need to see a little success, right? You can be. You know, baseball is such a difficult pl- game to play. You could be missing pitches by this much. Yeah. You can hit the ball very hard at somebody and they just catch it. Um, it's the same way as a quarterback. I just think he, that, that Deshaun needs to see a couple of games for some success. Like, if he comes out and he starts fast and he gets that success rolling, I think it becomes a domino effect because then it clicks. He's like, listen, I didn't forget how to play this game. Right. I didn't, you know, I didn't wake up one day and become garbage. And that confidence is usually the difference between the top-notch quarterbacks and the elite quarterbacks because the elite quarterbacks never lose confidence, ever. Yeah. And so from what Deshaun went through, I think he lost a little bit of confidence, and it's, it's human that's, nature. That's fair, yeah. That's it's fair. He lost a little confidence. Expected, right? I agree. I think getting off to a good start this season is huge for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He needs to, like, the first time we saw him play in 2022, he didn't look good. That first game the first time we saw him play good, last yeah. year, he didn't look good. If he comes out on opening day this year and looks great, his confidence will grow, right? And then the confidence of everybody around him and the fans, whether it matters if the fans are confident, I don't know. But it is, does matter his confidence, and it does matter that the team has confidence. And I'm glad they're not playing in Brazil. <laughs> like, look, hey, listen, you might catch the Eagles on some other time, but look, you know, it's a neutral site game. It's going to be the whole world's watching. Yeah. Listen, I want you to get your footing in a regular game and, and get off to a nice start, whether that's on the road or at home. So I, I don't even mind not playing in that game either. I don't know. I think the, the one thing about the Brazil game would have been I have, the, you know, I can imagine a, a G. Bush and Rose Bush podcast, oh. like on the road to Brazil. <laughs> Rose so yeah. I could see something special about that. Road to, that would have been good. That would have been crazy. I would have yeah. just, I would have, I wouldn't have left the country. Um, I'm, I'm not too keen on going to Brazil. I, it is a dangerous it's country. A, I think. People, it's like people don't really understand it. South America is not it's tough. kind. It's no. not. And oh, by, there's some countries that are okay. And but. did you know this? This is yeah. an interesting fact about South America. South America is way further east than people know. Ge- Geography-wise, if you leave New York yeah. and go straight down, you'll be right in the uh, Pacific Ocean. You won't even be... In South Wait, America, Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. If you no, no. Oh no, I get what you're saying. You, you, really? Yes. You sure from New York? Yes. Like eventually, you're saying once you get to South. That's how, South America. Yeah, yeah that's right. how far. Really? South America is. It's crazy. It's so much far east. People think South America is right well, underneath North America. He's not getting it. I didn't get it at first. I get what you're I, saying. I, I need to look at a map look, real quick. He's look, saying right? that South no, America right. is kind of going so much this way that eventually you get into the yeah. If you if the you Pacific. if you dri- I don't if you drive south from New York, you're able to drive, drive exactly south exactly straight straight down. You still end up in the uh, in the ocean crazy and you won't hit land. First, you'd be in the Atlantic Ocean, right? At, at southern, uh, you know, uh, U.S. All right, G. Is he crazy? You go through he Peru, right? and then you go through the south end of Peru into the ocean. I mean, you do touch a little bit of South America, but you are not. What do you, what do you mean? No, the Pacific, not South America. No, but you go through a little bit of South America. Yeah. And then hit the Pacific. So he's right. And wrong. Right and wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm, right I'm, 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 I'm three or four miles off. Let's, let's not say. But it's, it's way closer than I thought before I looked yeah, at this. Like, right. I did. That seems crazy. Crazy. All right, well, we'll leave it there with, with Deshaun. I will say that is, I like that he was in OTAs, and I like that he spoke on the first day. That's, that's taking leadership. Oh, yeah. Now, look, look, yeah. and I agree with this. Like, uh, I, was, I was yelling at my screen when I was at home. I said, Jason and Bull, you're still talking about Miles Garrett. But here's the thing. I got double standards. So, yeah. Deshaun Watson, I was actually happy that he showed up, right? Yeah. Because but wouldn't you have been happy if Miles Garrett showed up? I'm not saying we weren't killing him. No, you didn't we kill him. It wasn't bad. I'm just saying I'd rather him be there. Nah, Miles Garrett. I think Miles Garrett. Once he won that award, he could do whatever he okay. wants. Now, the, now Deshaun Watson, there's a new offense. And I was just saying, I think more than anything else, the fact that it's a a new offensive new coordinator, offense. new Tommy offense. Reese is in there. You have a new running backs coach. Yeah. The entire staff is. Well, let's talk Almost about... Almost slipped over, which I know yeah. we'll talk about in one second. Right, yeah. That right. makes it even more pivotal for yeah. Deshaun to be in there. Because these first two weeks, it's classroom meetings and workouts. It's yeah. lifting 
and meetings. Yeah. Miles doesn't need that. Yeah. Deshaun with the new system, yeah. it definitely is more beneficial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Unlike me, Anthony, Mike never knows when to shut up. So let's. Uh, <laughs> Mike knows better than this. <laughs> but real quick, guys, before we get ahead. into the offense speculation, yeah. when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. All you have to do is post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockedonnfl. That's linkedin.com slash lockedonnfl to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. That might be Anthony's best read right there. Yeah, it was. That was very well done. He had a good emotion. Well done, brother. Not looking at other sites. I like Honestly, that. Honestly, love LinkedIn. I think I found this LinkedIn's job on great. LinkedIn. Is what we talk about Cavs today? Later. Yeah. Later. Okay. Later. Go ahead. Uh, so. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. A friend of ours, Cameron Justin, tweeted out some quotes from yesterday. Justice. I'm not going to throw up on, on tag board right now. But Call Kevin, Cameron Justin. Justice. Oh. Justice? Justice. Oh, my apologies. Uh, but Kevin Stefanski and Ken Dorsey are working together right now to t- create an attacking offense. So I wanted to pitch to you guys, what do you guys think that's going to look like, especially with the questions of will Watson be there week one? Do we think Jameis can handle everything that Watson would probably have to handle too? I mean, my assumption is that Deshaun Watson will be ready to play in week one. I'm operating that same. But, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. I mean, they're not going to design a different offense for Jameis Winston. I mean, Jake, I, I'm pretty sure Jameis changed his middle name to aggressive. I mean, yes. <laughs> he's no stranger to aggressive. That's- the man threw 30 touchdowns and 30 picks in one season. He's the Luke, uh, Nuke Lelouch. <laughs> you can get that reference. Of, of the NFL. Uh I, I, yeah, absolutely. Whatever offense they're putting together, and when I think aggressive, I think of throwing the ball downfield. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah if, if Deshaun Watson is not ready to go, be a big bummer. But Jameis Winston will run the same exact offense, I would assume. Yeah. Listen, um, that I was I was excited when I heard attacking offense, and you know they talked about Kevin Stefanski and Dorsey talking about hey they came to the conclusion that they need a more attacking style offense. And so when you do get Jerry Judy and you do have Amari Cooper who, who run routes very well, I think, you know, this is a, a great opportunity to, to create a think tank and get a lot of different ideas about what the concepts of football that you want to run. And the great thing about it is when you get new people involved and you hear new thoughts and new ideas, um, it's, it's refreshing. Like sometimes I used to just during the week, uh, when, I, when I'm preparing for my radio show, I, I listen to everybody's shows, right? Because I want to see what the pulse is and I want to see what other people have to say about some of the same topics. And sometimes by listening to those individuals, it would spark something about, oh, yeah, I could come at this topic at a different angle. And football is, is, is you know, nothing's new under football, under the sky, under the sun. But sometimes, you know, being around other people gives you a different type of energy and different type of focus. I were, you know, Kevin Stefanski likes to run a lot of, you know, you know, spread people out with five wide and then throw the ball to tight ends and stick routes. We made a a lot of fun of that. But a lot of what the Cleveland Browns routes are, are, you know, some of the basic stuff, right? And they, they do a really good job of executing basic concepts at a high level. But when you get to the highest level, it's kind of difficult to run some of that basic stuff. You have to be more complicated, more motion, more vertical routes, more things where you can get bigger chunk plays. So for me, I like the fact that Dorsey is coming off with the Buffalo Bills and he's played with a quarterback that has an arm streak to do that. And I like the fact that he's coming off, uh, you know, uh, a place where he's had some success, but they thought he was a problem. He's going to be coming here hungry, writing different stuff up. And I'm, I'm waiting for to see what this playbook looks like, because I think this year truly will be a different playbook. Now, if you take just the Dorsey playbook, the one thing I don't like from what Ken Dorsey has done in the past that I don't think is translatable, and I'll get to the things I do think are translatable in a sec, he likes to run your quarterback. Yeah. And yeah. Josh Allen and Cam Newton are built differently than Deshaun Watson. You saw him up close and personal yeah. at lefties. It is no disrespect to Deshaun, but those two, Josh Allen and Cam Newton, Big are dude. freak of nature, 6'5", 250 pounds. I just feel like their bodies are more capable of taking hits, game in, game out, than a guy like Deshaun, especially who's coming off a season-ending shoulder injury. So I'm not thrilled if they go in the route of running Deshaun as a legitimate weapon in the running game 
more frequently than they have in the past. I don't know how you guys feel on that. I just, I just don't want – I think the risk I, is worth the reward on I that. I think – I agree with you, but I'm not as worried about that. I mean, last year – when Ken Dorsey was in Buffalo, they were making a point of trying to get Josh Allen to run less. And that's part of what right. kind of hampered how Josh Allen uh, had I played. I don't think, so. uh, to me, the Sean Watson, like, is not, obviously he's not as big as Cam Newton. He's not as big as Josh Allen, which, you know, those guys can take hits, although the hits destroyed Cam Newton's career. I mean, eventually, I mean, over, right? Of course, yeah, of I course mean, that played time, a yeah. big role, and he's just, the guy went off a cliff. But... Uh, I don't think, like, Deshaun Watson doesn't run. Like, Josh Allen is looking to run a lot. I don't feel like Deshaun Watson yeah. is looking to I run I just don't like want that. them to incorporate those. I don't want him taking more hits than he needs to. Hit, hit, so, if they I don't, don't need he, to run I, a design yeah, run, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not in favor of adding that wrinkle into the playbook. I think Deshaun's more of a, like, a, the, everything's breaking down. I, gotta I, make I, I agree. And yeah. that, that, I don't want to take that out of his game yeah, by sure, any means because he's an improviser, and that's yeah. what he does best. The things that I do think are translatable from what Ken Dorsey did from what Tommy Reese did at Notre Dame, from what they bring in with Deuce Staley in the running back position as, as, the head, as the coach of that position group into what happens next year, a vertical passing game. Like, that has to be the first thing. And you go back to last season in Buffalo, or not 2023, 2022, Josh Allen was letting the ball rip. Yeah. And Cam Newton, his entire career was much better at throwing deep balls than he was the intermediate short yeah. routes. When Deshaun was healthy in Houston, his deep ball was as good as any quarterback in football. Yeah. So I want to see that open up. Assuming... Deshaun's healthy for week one, and I don't know how you guys feel about Nick Chubb. I don't anticipate him being on the field for week one. What scares you more if you're a defense? Jerome Ford, Deonta Foreman, and Naheem Hines? Or Amari Cooper, Jerry, Judy, Elijah Moore, and David Njoku? Yeah, it, the passing. It's not close, so I, I'm looking at an offense that I think is going to be a 65-35, hell, even 70-30 pass-run split. I, I, I think it's going to be that gonna drastic be that. this year. I think you're going too far with 70-30, and, I, and you know I love the passing game. I do think they're going to be – more pass based than they've maybe ever been. I mean, maybe well, that year with Derek Anderson. I don't know how much. Yeah, right. How much, how much, it just it you know, seemed like it seemed like they threw the ball a lot. I know it probably isn't as high as, right. as I remember it because just in general, people ran the ball more. But yes, the Browns have been a primarily running team, even though they, even though every team in football, almost every team throws more than they pass. But I agree, the percentages will be higher. But I, I think seventy is going too far. And but yes, I. Nick, there's a decent chance Nick Chubb's not going to be ready for the start of the season. And even if he is, you know, you're not going to want to you give him a full load of carries. Yeah, ease him in. One, of the, one of the things we have not mentioned, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's natural. Um, how, how does the offensive line really transition into this passing attack? One of the things that we saw in the beginning of the year was the offensive line didn't seem like it was ready. It, to, to throw the ball that much. And there is a difference. I played offensive line. My brother played offensive line in college. It, there, there is a mindset where there's two different types of linemen. One of them is the offensive lineman that thinks that they're like skill positions. They're like, listen, <laughs> I'm athletic. <laughs> right. You bring all the blitzes you want. We can cover it up. And they, they're really smart and cerebral. And they're like, yeah. They like to point out who's coming and, and who's going. And they pick up blitzes very well. That's one mindset. Then there's another mindset of where you just, uh, you, we call them uh, knuckle draggers, where they, they want to put their hand in the dirt. They trying to double team. They trying to lock you off the football. Now, the Cleveland Browns have a mix of both, right? Uh, you know. Sure. Um, so, I don't know how they transition to, hey, we're going to throw the ball 70 times. So, guys, you don't need to hold, right? No holding penalties put us behind. Let Deshaun Watson move out and move around. Sometimes as an offensive lineman, when you don't have, you got a statue back there, kind of like Joe Flacco. Yeah, you do need to hold a little bit because you don't want your quarterback getting destroyed. Right. But when you got Deshaun Watson that can create, you go back and watch this film. You let a guy come free. Deshaun Watson always makes the first guy miss. So don't hold. It, it takes a little bit of time to, to develop that discipline and figure out the difference with what you was doing before and now what we're doing. Mitchell Schwartz, who obviously played in Cleveland, talked about transitioning from blocking for Alex Smith to Patrick Mahomes mm -hmm. and went into like tremendous detail. I forget what podcast it was, but it was a couple of years ago mm -hmm. on the difference in blocking for those two and the techniques. And it took him half a season, he said. And Mahomes, when he started as a, I guess it was his second you know season. You he started his first here, Mitchell that's what I said. He started he, as a He was good yeah. when he was on this he show. He came on this show, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was oh, good when he But he like said him. he said in Mahomes' first year as a starter, so his second year in yeah. the league, he goes, it took me half the season to figure out 
okay, if this guy beats me at this angle against Alex Smith, it's a sack. Right. If this guy beats me at this angle with Patty back there, he's taking two steps up, and that's going to open up so many yeah. holes to the yeah. right to escape mm-hmm. from, right. and no one's better in the league at doing that. So yep. I do think there is credence to that, Jim. Yeah. But I also, can you practice that, or is that natural game instincts you just develop through legitimate reps against opposing? I, I'm not sure if you could actually work that out, it's especially the with the new yeah. offensive I mean, line How coach. could you really it, practice? Yeah, I, I it, don't know. It's the reps. It's, it's, that's, why, that's why it's so crazy. It's almost cheating. When you got a quarterback that's been playing forever, yeah. and then you got left tackles and the guys up front that have been playing for four or five years, that's when you start to develop that stuff. And yeah. that's how you say, how come we can't tackle Patrick Mahomes? Well, but <laughs> when you do get a shot at them, yeah. like they're not giving you any negative plays back. They're not going to hold you. They're going to count on him to make you look silly. And then we go in our field. Right. And then so that's that's the type of thing you need to gel with. So for me, remember the first game that we played Pittsburgh, the second game of the season. You remember Jed Wills was like swimming. Yeah. Uh, t- it was bad. It was bad. bad. Like yeah. he he was lining up. Uh, it, it just looked like he was confused. The offensive line's got to change its mindset and be prepared. That's what the offseason is for. But yeah, you're right. There's so only so much you can do in practice. It's getting used to playing with that guy. Frankly, they haven't played with Deshaun Watson that much. No, and that's part of the issue. All right, it won't be the last conversation about that. Let's talk some Guardians. Yeah, it's time to get into Guardians, guys. But before that, I've been told I'm a pretty competitive person, and after all my years of playing soccer, I think it's pretty true. But my competitive side is a huge fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist of Monopoly where you play not on one board, but on hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part, messing with your friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties just like real Monopoly, but now I can also rob their vaults and get their riches for myself, and the leaderboard showed me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. All you have to do is go get the game at Download Monopoly Go for free on the App Store or Google Play. And speaking of crazy, let's get to the Guardians. Man, what a win. That game last night. What a win. One of the best games I'd have seen in a long time. It was interesting as heck. You know, something you could say about the Guardians that you certainly couldn't say last year, they are fun to watch. Yes, they are. Right? I mean, that game was absolutely bonkers. 10-7 the final. And... You know, what's wild about the start, first of all, the Guardians are have the best record in baseball right now. Well, none of us predicted. Nope. They are fifth in runs scored per game. They are fifth in hits per game. They are 13th in home runs per game. These are all numbers that we would not have expected. Maybe Tyvis did because he that was no, his bold Ty- prediction. Tyvis didn't expect it. He no, just he didn't expect it. He was just there, making yeah. a bold prediction. And obviously, it's still very early. We're only three weeks into the season. However, it, it is crazy Tanner Bybee was okay. You know, he pitched a decent game. Mm-hmm. It wasn't great, but he you get was a beat. decent. But it's crazy because the Guardians, you thought if they were going to get off to a great start, it would be all about the starting rotation. And it's been about everything but. Mm-hmm. They've hit the ball well. They've, they've run the bases well. They've played defense well. And the bullpen's been, for the most part, the bullpen blew it yesterday, and then eventually Barlow a lot. But for the most part, the bullpen's been good. It's the starting rotation that's been the only negative for the most part. But the, let's let's focus on the offense right now, guys, because they are cooking with gas right now. Boy, when you get Gabriel Arias hitting, he's been hot. Hit, listen, L'Oreal too hot. Man, for, hey, listen, Freeman hit a ball out of the stadium. I said, where, where, where did you get this from? I mean, Jose does what Jose is doing. Yeah. Um, I, I just thought, you know, what it was the most impressive thing was, you know, when they lost the lead, right? You know, the bull campaign gave up them runs. And they could, the uh, Red Sox come back to take the lead. Yeah. It was like, you could see where it's like, oh, we kind of lost that. Let's pack this up. Right. But no, nah, they came right back with good at bats, solid hits. And the cool thing about it is they weren't trying to do too much at the plate. It was like, let, let, let's make contact. Let's, let's spray it the other way. Let's get some blue pits. And you mentioned this, running the bases. How many times guys sliding under tags yep. guys they had to re- overturn two or three calls yeah, on yeah, the base yeah. paths yep. so to me that that was super impressive little small things like that scoring runs being able to to slide you know sliding is an art running the bases yep. is an art yeah so you know uh mcnuggets i, I just overall very inter- entertaining game and, and yeah. like he said they are fun to watch oh they're fun as hell and on top of some of the numbers bull mentioned so they're twelve and five in baseball. Yeah. They're nine and two on the road, which is the best road record in baseball. Hammy said. I think the, it's. Go ahead. He said on the call last night the last time a Cleveland baseball team started nine and two on the road, nineteen forty eight. The Indians won the World Series. There you go. Yes. So, all of it's coming together. Now, granted, 
17 games into the season. There's a lot of baseball to play. Yeah. But I do think the sustainability of the offense, it may not be at the, the level they're at now, but I just think overall this lineup is way better than we gave it credit for beforehand. And a couple stats I found this morning to back that up. According to Fangraphs, Bull, and I know you like your advanced mm-hmm. baseball, they qualify hard hits. Yeah. Is anything that leaves the bat with a 95 exit velo or higher, which is you know not always right. a hit, doesn't guarantee you're on base, but right. hard hit. They have so far this season. I want to read this from my my phone I so I don't get this wrong. They were last in the big leagues last year. They were second last in the big okay. leagues last year. Yeah. They have eight players this season already with double digit hard hit hard hits. Okay. So eight different players with at least ten times they put the bat on the ball yeah. with the 95 exit velo. Yeah. They are on pace to triple the number of hard hits they had last season. That's, triple. I mean, I'm talking crazy. triple, which means, once again, these aren't guaranteed to be home runs. They're not doubles. No. Just making solid no, contact. No, they could be outs. They could, and a lot but of times they are. But the your bottom battle line rate is, is the harder you hit the ball, the, better chance the more you often you're going to get a hit. Yes. And I was going through and looking back and at the 9-2 and two road record. Yeah. On the road, they've beaten Luis Castillo, George Kirby, Pablo Lopez, and Cutter mm, Crawford mm, so far. Mm, These, mm. They're not just beating up yeah. bad yeah. pitching. Like, they've beat some really good pitchers, and not just the traditional stats, the home runs, the hits. Yeah. The advanced stats back up at this lineup. It's not the Dodgers. It's not yeah. the Yankees. It's not the Braves. But it's also not one of the two or three worst lineups in baseball. And the most impressive thing last night to me, Bull, G, bottom nine, you're down one. You have 8-9-1 up. Yeah. 8-9-1. How many times last year was 8, 9, and 1, guaranteed out, guaranteed out, and then yeah. you try to start some of the top what of the you lineup? What do you mean? 6, 7, 8, 9, 1. Fair <laughs> enough. I mean, it's but telephone, this team, yes, telephone Freeman, numbers. Freeman in the ninth spot, <laughs> yeah. off the wall double. You have yeah. Quan, you have Jimenez, Jose, even in the ninth Well, they inning. got three straight. Well, the, they, the first, uh, who was, let off the inning? Well, Arias got, Arias Arias got out. out. Yep. Freeman got off the wall. Hits. Quan yeah. singles, Jimenez singles. Jose yeah. rips it to right field. Abreu yeah. makes a great catch in right field. Right. That was a fantastic play. It was, and he overran it, comes back, oh, yeah. catches it over his oh, head like that. that like, play. That listen, was, he also, he also threw out. He to almost get Quan at first. I mean, they called him out at and first. They, and to Jimenez. He, he, the yeah, he threw yeah. Jimenez yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, no, yes. But then but the, the Quan, well, the yeah. Quan, he had no, a great, he, had a, he also had the error, which allowed Jimenez. Yeah, that's right. true. So, uh, yeah, but, he booted the ball. But overall, the fact that the bottom of the lineup against the closer, and Kenley Jansen's like 700 years old. He's not an Yeah, he's not what he was. But still, you can't Eight nine one came through when it mattered most. And it's, it, it's been fun as hell to watch. Bull. We were just talking yesterday on the Ultimate Cleveland Guardian show. Zach said, this team is winning games like they don't usually win games in the past. And, and then they did it again last night. It's like, as you said, G, they blow a lead. You're like, oh, here we go. Hey, so it's right. over. They're not going to score. They have been a clutch. Yeah. Our guy, Jay Crawford, who I haven't seen in a couple of weeks, put, you know, texted, you know, this team's got the clutch gene. And they certainly have. I mean, they have had so many... Big, Three extra inning wins hits. in the last week. In the and, last week. Three. Yeah. And, 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 and sometimes there's um, there's something to be said for a change in philosophy. When you are when your front office, you know, is keeping ledgers with how many times you swing and miss, <laughs> and you're right. like, hey, how many pitches did you take up there? Hey, we need to at least see ten pitches this this at bat from you. You're like, listen, I'm I'm trying to go up there and I'm trying to see the first thing I can see and and, and put the bat on the ball and, and get a stroke like. It's not that bad. It's they're finding out it ain't bad to go up there and swing hard. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a death sentence to go well, up there and say I'm trying to I'm trying to hit the ball hard somewhere yeah. and be aggressive. And no one embodies that more than Stephen Kwan this season. That's where it's just and I don't know if you saw this yeah. stat, and I'll let you run with this. Yeah, Cleveland stats at Clee underscore stats tweeted this out this morning. Bull. Yeah. In Major League Baseball since 1930, so going back 90, years. 94 years now. Yeah. Players under 27 years old with 18 runs and 29 hits in the first 17 games of a season. Stephen Kwan and Hank Aaron. Wow. That's the list. <laughs> That's the list. I did not see that. Done. Stat. Under 27, yeah. 19, uh, under 27 29 hits, God. 18 runs in 17 games. Stephen Kwan and, Stephen Kwan and, <laughs> and Hank Aaron, who did it twice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hank Aaron is the most <laughs> underrated baseball player in the history. I almost killed G. Bush. <laughs> right over there? Like, yo. <laughs> like, you know, listen, Hank Aaron. <laughs> Hank Aaron, to me, is the most underrated oh player gosh. in the history of sports. Quan Aaron. This guy, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, you, I would have never thought that. Like, just, it's just yeah. funny. But to me, 
I don't know. This may be stereotypical, but I like when I see Quan up there, I'd be just making. I buy. It. Look at Ichiro. This is Ichiro. This is our version of Ichiro. Like I even thought. Like I'm like, man, this dude. If he has a clo- a career anywhere close to Ichiro, then it's a I'm, hell of a career. I mean, yeah. he look. He he has one of them swings where it looks like he just he's just gonna automatically hit the ball. It's just about whether or not he's gonna put it in play where people aren't. His hands. He gets his hands in the hitting zone so fast and he's able to get them from tight. He's able to get them. His hands are just always in place and I'm like pitches inside. I'm like, he'll never get that. No, and he gets to b- barrel the bat on it and sprays it and puts it in play. I'm like this guy's he, he, it's, he's tremendous just to watch. Yeah. Did he have three uh, hits yesterday? Yeah, three and he had the one up the middle. He had the one in the ninth one to uh, yeah. left field. I'm trying to blank on what the, the third one was. Uh, but he just, he always seems to make solid cuts. Now, he struck, struck out more this season, and he sacrificed. I don't care about that. No, no, no. I'm, uh, I'm not saying yeah. that's a negative. He sacrificed a little bit of swing and miss to add more power. Uh, right. But it, it's not like he's sacrificing contact either. <clears throat> no. He's still hitting damn near 390. He that's leads nice. Major League Baseball in hits. Yeah, he was three for five, two runs and a walk. Here's the thing about Quan. Quan, I it's love Quan. He was on our show. Uh, he was great with us. Phenomenal. I heard him on MLB radio. I loved him there, too. He is an old-school leadoff hitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's not a lot of guys like that in baseball anymore. But the flaw in his game was that he was a little too passive at the plate in his first two years. Even his first year, where he had a really good year. He was too passive at the plate, as you just talked about. And they were as a team. Yeah, that's, yeah. And he wasn't making hard, enough hard contact. You know, and eventually, and it caught up with him last year. And that's why he wasn't, he was still good, but he wasn't as good. Well, he made it, and, and I think a lot of these guys, but especially Stephen Kwan, made a concerted effort this, this offseason to mm-hmm. say, hey, it's okay if I strike out a little. We don't want him striking out 150 times. He's not going to strike out 150 times. But he said, I don't have to, I don't have to never strike out. Right. It's okay to strike out sometimes, to be more aggressive, and to, to get, you know, to drive the ball a little more. And yeah, he's not going to hit a million home runs, but he's got two already. I, I, he's got a chance. I think I wouldn't be surprised if he had ten this year, mm-hmm. which for him would be great. And he's going to hit a lot. I bet you it's a lot more doubles and triples mm-hmm. because he's hitting the ball with more authority. And as you said, he gets his hands in the zone and through the zone really quick. He uses his body great. He sprays the ball to all fields. He's just a, a, an old school term. He's a professional hitter. That's what he is. And, and I love him. And he creates energy. He's enthusiastic. He plays the field well. He plays. He runs the bases. Does everything well. Turns singles into doubles. Yeah. Um, great gold gold glove winner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's he's a guy. <clears throat> he's he's a guy. Well, you know, we talked about it before. He had took a little step back last year. Yeah. Looks like he's playing better this year. Uh, him and his is 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 is. is Swinging the bat. He looks back. Look, looks like I didn't like that bunt early. He bunts too much, but besides that, I love him. And, and, and because the pop, it, it seems like he has the pop back. Like you know, yeah. he, he may not have the home runs um, yet, they're but, but they're yeah, coming. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. because he's getting he's getting solid contact on the on the ball. Uh, in general, and Will Brandon, shout out to him. He, yeah. he listen and Florio. He had a big big hit. I, last I, night. And listen, some of the guys, some of these guys will regress. Some of them. Yes. Uh, but. I think we've seen enough. Like we like what we've seen from Freeman and Rocchio and and this week Florial and Arias. Like and, and Brennan, sh- don't don't and don't Brennan, they're Brennan showing that. signs of life. And uh, Manzardo is going to be here in the next few weeks. The ladder hit his and, first home run. And yesterday. eventually the ladder is going to be here, and it'll get better. Um, but kudos to Florial because I know Jason and I both thought he was days away from getting cut by the Guardians, mm-hmm. and he's gotten hot. He had a big hit late in this game, yep. obviously. So yeah, I mean, listen. As we started this whole segment, they are a ton of fun to watch. Bybee pitched better. We need more progress from him. Barlow did a good job getting the yeah. save at the end. And, and, uh, and he's playing a lot of guys, too. Yeah, he's, Guys are getting at bats. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, Nobody's it's not, rusty on the bench. That's true. And uh, this is way down the pipeline, yeah. but we talk about they have the first pick in the draft. Yeah. Most likely had some type of See, power hitter. Like seven home runs in a row. It, it, well, seven the, days in a row. Caglione has seven games. Yeah, so I'm talking Nick about. Kurtz has eight home runs See, in his I'm, last six games. We should be happy. Carson, We're gonna Charlie, we, should be, yeah. we should be pumping this. But also, like, this counts. Also, their first round pick last year, this guy Ralphie Velasquez. Oh, my God. He is a He has a four home kid. runs and 10 RBIs in have 10 games. Have you seen games. what he looks like? Yeah, he's, a, he's 18 he's like or 19. Bush. He's a tank, yeah. <laughs> so, 
We need these. These are young prospects. You're yeah, yeah, not going to pan out. But yeah, he's a he's not ready. He's only he's yet, 18 but. or 19. But they have yeah. some what appears to be, and they'll add another one with this first pick in the draft. Some legitimate power coming through the pipelines yeah. in ways that I'm not quite sure the Guardians slash Indians have had in a long, well, long time. Well, it's exciting. For, we usually don't pay attention to the baseball draft. Certainly, we're not going to spend months and months on it. But you know, in the middle of the summer when there's not much else going on, in yeah. The NBA, we're going to be paying attention to the draft. <laughs> I love this Caglione. I saw him play last year. You know, I'm not the authority on the baseball draft, but he's right in the mix to be the top pick. And he's, he's a, a guy and a that looks like he could be in the majors by next season. Yeah, yeah. I, need, I need that. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to all summer leagues. Um, minor league baseball. <laughs> all I need these. He's gonna start doing live streams, uh, <laughs> post game yeah. reactions to Cape Cod League. Yeah, bless <laughs> I, 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 Hey, I want the new age Tommy Bell yeah. and, 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 and this home run by the way. Jeff, you didn't see this. Hey, with a homer. This went over Hold the on, scoreboard. Rewind that. rewind that. Look at the size of this hey, guy. Hey. He's six five, about two forty five. Look at him lumbering down these base paths. He throws ninety eight. G. Shut up. He's a pitcher too. Oh yeah, we starting you both ways. Coach Prime, you're, you're the new Travis. 560. I mean, no, it's yeah. metal back. It's an aluminum back. Hey, it's like so. they're playing the A's. Hey, 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 Travis Hunter. Listen, we he the new Travis Hunter. We we need Travis that. Hafner. No, Travis no. Hunter. Oh, he's hey, playing, Colorado playing he's both, playing sides both of the ball. ways. Oh, okay. <laughs> or you can just say he's Shohei Otani. I, I thought big power hitting lefty. I thought you were talking about Travis Hafner. Hafner. Nah, slow it yeah. down. Look at hey, listen. If look, they let Major look at League the baseball, tree trunks on that man's yeah. legs, man. If they let MLB players use aluminum bats. Oh God! I told oh, the pitchers you. Would pitchers would die. Pitchers would die. No, gee, you. it would kill. It would literally kill I people. I told you. You have to put the net. You know how when the batting practice yeah. have the net, you'd have to have the net in front of the. It, would, it would. I need. I need, I need the home run derby. You would. You would kill people. Oh, the home run derby. Well, you could put the net with the home run. Well, derby. With the metal bats, I want to see people put the ball on Can the you roof. Imagine you, Aaron Judge with a metal. Oh, bat. but you couldn't. <laughs> you literally. You literally could not. Yeah. Put people in the stands, gee. I'm telling you. They would hit that with exit. Well, they have a net now around the whole stand. Yeah. Well, even in the outfield, they'd be hit exit velos of like 170. <laughs> That's true. You wouldn't, be able, you wouldn't really? be able to have fans in the outfield. No, you had, it, it would be empty they, stadium. They would, you think Somebody they would get, get hurt? Killed. Yeah. <laughs> if they're not paying attention, gee, uh, exit. That hits you Giancarlo Stanton with a wood bat hit 119 exit velo home run last season. That's 150 miles off the bat. If that's at the right angle, yeah, you can be dead. I mean, that's in the chest. Yeah. You're stopping someone's. That's head. beautiful. We should have done that during COVID when nobody was in the stadiums. Anyway. That would have been awesome. Right. That, that, that would have been, been so good, much fun. Yeah, but they didn't have. They didn't even have an All Star game that year, though. Yeah, here's the 12 game mark. Who's your All Stars at? After I mean, games? Here, okay, here, listen. Okay, listen. Here's what we're gonna do. I want to put this out, and I need y'all to make this go viral. I need somebody help me. Y'all help me. I would like to see Major League Baseball player, whoever you are. Do this for us, right? Get the metal bats, and in batting practice, we would like to see who could put the ball furthest out of the, out of the stadium. It's called the metal the metal bat challenge. I want to see if it starts with the minor leagues. If you're a minor league watching it, make sure you see this. I want to see what you can do with a metal bat, yeah. right? I want to eventually get this to the point where Okunya. Uh, Judge Stanton, yeah. all of. I want to see how far you could put this baseball out of the stadium with an empty stadium I, with a metal bat. I'm I think challenging about you. Some of the players that played over the years, like Ryan Howard with the Phillies, he, he great guy by the way. Uh, Glenn Allen Hill. Do you remember Glenn Allen Hill? Oh, Glenn Allen Hill yeah. was Jack. Remember Pete and Cavillia? Yeah. <laughs> Pete and Cavill- What a name! How about how about you know <laughs> once once Bonds and McGuire steroided up and Conseco and Sosa. Oh man, listen. Metal bats. Albert Bell. Bra- Bra- Brady. Brady oh, Anderson. Yeah, yeah, he got Jack. He get Brady Anderson fifty home runs yeah, that, as a. That was crazy. <laughs> he Brady. Had been like ten a year. Ten a year. Hey, everybody was a home run hitter back then, yeah. bro. All right, we got, we're going to bring on Zach Jackson. We'll get back to the, the Browns here. The draft, guys, is eight days away. That's crazy. You believe this? And yeah. we're going to play a game. Or Jack, oh, Zach's coming in person, so he's going to join us. Yeah, we're going to bring about? Zach out like here real wrong. quick. Uh, Earl, you can take him out while I do this quick read. Oh, Zach's here already. I yeah, think. he's yeah. here. He's ready to go. Earl will bring him out. But I want to remind you guys, like I said earlier, I think I found this job on LinkedIn. And when you're hiring for a small business, you want to find quality professionals like myself that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for the right team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. 
In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Call post your job for free on linkedin.com slash NFL. That's linkedin.com slash NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, Zach Jackson has been covering the Browns forever with the athletic. <laughs> That's why I look so old. Time. I look that old. Look in the studio. Old. Yeah. How many years has it been you've been covering Well, this will be year 25 of the team. And yeah. I started as an intern with the team in 2000, so all but the first one in some regard. I haven't yeah. been there, but uh, the, 2017, the athletic, I've been to every game but one, you That's know, right. everywhere. Is the, so. is the organization in the best shape it's been since coming back? Yeah, no, that's a low bar, but that's an absolute <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's the king. I'm the comments. Yeah. This guy got them yeah, all. <laughs> that's an absolute yes, right? Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, kudos to the owners for finally sticking with someone. Right. Pick, picking the right people and sticking with them. Um, Andrew Berry's not perfect, but he's pretty darn good. Yeah. Uh, I think he trusts the people around him. He and Kevin work together well. Um, you know, Kevin is, again, not perfect, but he's really good. I think the record reflects that. I yeah. think some of the changes he's made, that even when maybe he didn't want to, reflects that, right? Did really well last year. Yeah. Go and find Schwartz and go and find Bubba Ventrone. Yeah. Um, and adapting to what he's had on offense and having to change. So, yeah, I think they're smart people. I think there's good people. And I think that's reflected. Now, can they get to the next step? Yeah. Can they actually hang a banner of some sort? We'll see. But, yeah, I think you should, as a fan, have a level of faith that you probably have not been able to have. What's the hold up with contract extensions right now, Zach? Is, is there something holding it up? I don't think so. I think okay. it's just timing on that. I think, right. you know, I think the Haslam's about three, four weeks ago at the meetings came out and said. Right. So, it's yeah. so yeah. So there's a timing for all of that stuff. Okay. Fair enough. When you look at Stefanski, uh, you know, he's grown on a lot of people. And I think it helps that you got two Coach of the Year awards, right? Um, is he res- respected around the league as a person who has two Coach of the Years? Because I would think that when you have those awards, it puts you in a different little echelon and a different perch. Do, is he viewed like that around the league? I think he should be. I mean, I think, Garrett, when you frame it like that, you could say that usually goes to people who have won deep in the playoffs or, or something like that. But, yeah, people like Kevin Stefanski. He paid his dues. Um, kudos to the Browns and to Paul DePodesta for finding him. You know, he only got one other coaching interview ever. Yeah. He wasn't one of these guys that's on right. these lists for six years or, you know, is a hot name because he has an agent plugging it or, you know, something like that. He's very low-key. Uh, but I really think that he, over the last couple of years, has earned the respect of that locker room. And it's not a straight line. It's dealing with what they went with. I mean, he and Baker had a really ugly breakup. And a lot of people didn't want to talk about it. And he certainly didn't want to talk about it. Right. But then he went into this, which has been a mess with Watson, yeah. right? But guys have played hard. Miles Garrett has grown up. David Njoku has grown up. And I'm just telling you, last year there was a different vibe in that locker room. Is that the reason that this team stuck together and won in December? I don't know. But from the older guys to the younger guys, the new guys that have been around, there was a completely different vibe, and we trust what's going on here. You know, we're not going to be perfect every week. Before they went on that, that winning streak in December to get hot, you know, they lost those two road games. Yeah. You know, they had to change three quarterbacks in four weeks and right. bring Flacco off the couch. So even when you take out what Flacco did, I think that speaks to the organization and specifically the head coach and the guy's buy-in of sticking together and being right. Because that's really what it comes down to, right? You want to have that one month. And they, they had it last December. Would they prefer to have it in January? Sure. sure. Of course. But they don't even get to the playoffs without that run. And they don't set the tone and the vibe of everything without that. I'm curious. You mentioned he only had one, Stefanski only had one other interview. How did the Browns identify him as the guy who was the right person to kind of change the tune of this franchise? Well, they're so secretive about everything that they won't give a full answer on that. <laughs> but Paul D. Podesta is the guy that you connect the dots that had identified him you know, through that. So when you look at what Stefanski did, coming from basically the secretary for the head coach in Minnesota to position coach to coordinator, he worked for respected guys. Uh, for Brad Childress, for Mike Zimmer, very different guys mm. in that regard. You know, got his chance to be the coordinator. He was first called up in December, like in a madness situation, right? And then he did it for a full year. So um, it, 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 it's good, good scouting, you yeah. know, and then right. it's saying, and this has been the biggest thing here. Okay, we know what we've done hasn't worked. So how does it work? How do we connect the dots? And I think that started with putting Barry and Stefanski together. And then obviously that first year, it was, it was wild. It was COVID. It was all those things. Nobody saw that team win on 11 games, but they did. And then what's most impressive is they kind of crashed back to reality a yeah. little bit. 
But I think what they did last year is they validated the roster. Yeah, everybody who said this is a top six, eight, ten roster is right. probably right because they did it last year with five quarterbacks, right? And, yeah. and now can you get to that next step? I think you have to have at least a little bit of trust in the guys at the top. Well, we started today's show talking about Deshaun Watson and his press conference yesterday. I know you were there, Zach. I took from that a guy who sounded confident taking the lateral and progressive steps towards getting back to being healthy, hopefully for week one. There was some discourse afterwards whether or not everyone interpreted his words in the same way. Yeah. How did you take what Deshaun said, being there in person and, and being able to read his body language up close? And well, I would think the number one takeaway as far as judging that was he did feel like he's in a good spot, right? He did feel like he's on the same page with the doctors, with his team, with the Browns team, um, that he's going to be ready. So we're long past the ideal world situation yeah. with this guy yeah, and his sure. contract and whatever. And it's not ideal for him to miss the spring. But in the realm of a team that's goals are way down the road in those months we already talked about, yeah. it's fine. You know, so it's not comfortable um, not knowing quarterback throwing shoulder, talking about an injury that's not a football injury mm -hmm. because pitchers come back and they struggle with it and they don't get blasted by 280-pound defensive ends right. all the time, yeah. right? But, like, we're not judging this team on the second week of training camp if he suddenly needs a day off, right? right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see Jameis in there throwing it to the other team. You know, nobody <laughs> wants to see four <laughs> quarterbacks having to play again. We love Jameis on the show. Sure, no. We and love Jameis. Yes. He can eat two and two, two touchdowns, two picks. Yes. It's, it's, it's even. Right. 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 But, so, you know, we know this team's ceiling is Deshaun Watson yes. being healthy, being almost fully available, and getting more progressively better. Yeah. And, you know, all the things that have been, we hadn't seen it. We finally saw him play well last year. This is a significant injury. It kind of dampens it. But there is, like, some real – We've seen it. Tangible Let's evidence. Let's see, you know, if he's in there, if he's healthy with this team they put around him. This can be yeah. an AFC contender. Zach, obviously we have, that have been here a long time and you longer than us, uh, we're used to the Super Bowl – or the Super Bowl. We're used to the draft being the Brown Super Bowl, right, for so many sure. years. We're talking <laughs> – yeah. when, when Dustin and I were doing the show, by November we're talking draft. Well, the last couple of years we haven't done that. This year we barely talked about the draft at all, and it's eight days away. Part of that's they don't have a first-round pick. Yeah. But part of it is there's not an obvious position that they have to take. So they're really in a position to take the best player available. Right. Do you agree with that? And do you think, you know, where are you leaning towards what they might do? Totally. I don't even think it's that. They're in the position to take the best player for the future. There's not a guy, barring yeah. a bunch of injuries or a sudden change, that's going to start for this team on day one. True. That doesn't mean they won't, they'll close the door if a guy's mm -hmm. great, and that includes right. the second, third round, you know, down the list. But they're looking for good players, premium positions, right? Um, are they going to take an offensive tackle for the future? I don't know. I think you lean towards trusting these guys, and it, you, you finally have a first-rounder next year. But when you look at defensive line, the value of that in Schwartz's defense, the old guys they have on the current yeah. defensive yeah. line, and then you look at the state of the receiver position, where Amari's great and probably is still going to be great, but this is year 10. This is right. the age 30 season, and realistically, he didn't finish last year. I mean, he, he got back out right. there, but he wasn't the same yeah, guy. That's true. So, you know, they're, they're, they're hoping Cedric Tillman takes a leap. He might. They're yeah. obviously banking on Jerry Judy doing what he hasn't done before. Yeah. They might be right. But I'm not closing the door on defensive line wide receiver. Um, that's where I kind of start there. Speaking of Jerry Judy, did you, what did you think when they signed the extension? Did you like it? Not like I it? fell out of my chair. Like, what are they doing? So That's how I felt. I just yeah. felt like this. I, I'm going to – again, this is where the benefit of the doubt comes in but yeah. compared to past regimes. Sure. T t trading two third-day picks and taking a shot on Jerry Judy, especially because that was probably your most realistic option, that makes – sense yeah. i just think let him be hungry let him play for that kind yes to do it before he ever sets foot in the building that really struck me as strange it, it just did I, well i was gonna get to that a little bit anyway um let's talk about their fiscal policy like the browns are doing things like from our standpoint that other teams aren't doing fiscally right they're, they're you know paying a lot of upfront money redoing contracts renegotiating contracts is that something that comes from the Podesta, is that something that comes from Andrew Barry? And is this something that other teams are doing? Because it seems like they're just doing mental, they're doing financial gymnastics every week with these contracts. Is this something that we, we might see other teams do, or is this just specifically to the Browns? Well, first and foremost, they're outspending everyone. Flat cash, they're outspending everyone. It's not so, close either. No, it's not close. So that doesn't discount Deep Podesta and Barry's long-term vision. That doesn't discount, 
you know, sitting down and saying, we know the cap's going to rise. We know there's tricks you can do with contracts and, and all of that. There is a long-term vision. There are things you have to do to build a contender. But flat out, they have more money available, and they're doing it. And last year, what made it so good, Garrett, they picked out Miles Garrett. They pushed that money forward. He had a great year. Najoku finally had the big year. They yeah. pushed his money forward. But Tony and Teller, solid again, as they've always been. They yeah. come out healthy. You feel good about that there. Right? You do that with the wrong guy, you get in trouble. Well, Conklin was the one bad one. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, and we'll see. Eventually, yeah. it's not going to work, and eventually right. you can't pay everyone, and you're going to have to really think about trading off Greg News. All that stuff is just conversation points right, now. Right. They don't have to. But they've, they've picked the right guys, but they are outspending. They have outspent, and you know they've found guys in their prime that were on the roster. Miles Garrett. Yeah. The, the best example, they just right. did it with Denzel Ward, who's going into year seven, but it's still the top of his game, premium position. And when you have that that kind of money to do it, you might as well do it and, and figure it out. They didn't, they haven't restructured Deshaun yet. They don't have to. Yeah. They can, they might for the rollover. Right. But like, they're going to have him at a $64 million cap number. And right now they're comfortably, they're 14 yeah. million under the cap. It's amazing. For that all is the, crazy, by the way. Right. Yeah. For all the criticism of Jimmy. They've and, bought their way there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but For still. For all the criticism of Jimmy, and it's all it's all been deserved, or at least 99.9% yes. yes. of it. 100%. You got to give him credit. He don't care. He'll spend. Yes. And, and in unlimited. Cleveland especially, we are not used to that. We got a baseball team that doesn't spend. <laughs> they have a great front office, but they don't help. The owner doesn't help them. Jimmy will spend whatever it takes. Uh, the me, fact that he's spe- spending more than Jerry Jones yeah, and these crazy. other big market owners is, is crazy. Let me tell you a story, Bull. So in a good year for the Browns, they're, they're not firing everybody or something yeah. doesn't go totally off the rails. We'll only talk with the Haslams on the record twice a year. Right. Once is in training camp, the first two or three days in a yeah. group interview. So there's six cameras around. There's 20 media people, whatever. Right. The second is at the owners' meetings yeah. where it's usually in a side room no cameras, four, five, six of us, depending on the year, right? And they know what we're going to talk about, the stadium, Deshaun Watson, the salary right. cap, whatever. So there's kind of like, it, I don't want to say it's awkward, but it's they know what we're going to ask. Right. They have their answers, can whatever. Yeah. So we finally kind of break down the wall this year. We're in some room at the, ho- in the basement of the hotel in Orlando. And I forget what was asked of Jimmy, but he starts laughing and he says, you can criticize us for a lot of things. And I understand. He said, for spending money and commitment to the community, you cannot. And I just noted that yeah. right there. Yeah. Like, right. Right. okay, you know, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go deeper with the analysis. I'm going to say yeah. more, but I'm going to make sure this is there because right. well, that's, that's, that's where he's we, we talked about it Monday, but you weren't here. But Jay asked, what's the difference in how much the Browns are spending this year in cash versus the next? It's like 50 to 60. I forget the exact number. Yeah, that's insane. It's like 55-ish million dollars more than the second team yeah. in the NFL. I wanted to ask about the stadium, though, Zach, because Jason, you obviously work with Jason, who's on the show. And we've gone back and forth what – he thinks is going to happen versus what he thinks is the ideal scenario in your mind if the Haslam's could have it their way what do they want and then what do you think at the end of the day will end up happening well I think what they would want is a dome down here but I think we're at the point where it's probably not feasible right so I think Brook Park is probably what is going to go in, in the dome. I just and I think it just makes sense on more. So Jason is more in the weeds and in the details of how it'll go, who will bend first. There's going to be negotiations on, on all that stuff. But I'm pretty confident, specifically coming out of Orlando, when they basically made public what we thought. There's two options: to do a billion dollars down here, and still be outside, still have traffic problems, still be stuck on the lake and the highway, all that. I just think I, I'm not saying it's ideal. I think it makes the most sense. You know, when you look at the Browns roster, <clears throat> you look at the coach, two-time coach of the year, you got defense player of the year, you got great defense, you look like you got everything moving in the right direction. But I'll be laughing and t- joking with these guys. It just seems like, yeah, the Browns get better, but people in the division keep getting Yes. I mean. It's a gauntlet. It's like, Is this the best division ever? Right. It, it's, it's worth discussing. Yeah. You know, and a, and a lot of times, right, they're in the NFL, quarterback gets hurt, you get tanked. Right, right. Some, there's a roster or two every year that everybody thinks they're good and they get old in a hurry or right. they were never that good yeah, yeah, or yeah. whatever. But like last year, it lived up to it, right? Everybody thinks Pittsburgh is clearly the fourth best team in the division. They were in the playoffs again, yeah. right? When the Bengals got Burrow healthy and got hot in October and early November, it was like they can win the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Well, they end up finishing fourth, but they get hot at the end of the year with Jake right. Browning, yeah, right? Right, right? Yeah. Right. No, I, I mean, realistically, I think the Browns prove they're a good roster. I think the Browns have proved they're a good organization. And I think if things go well, that they are a real AFC contender. That being said, you ask me to pick right now, I pick them third in the division. That's yeah. that's right, that's right, how right. good I think it is. Yeah, and and, and it's got to be the only division I could ever remember 
where you can make an argument that all four teams can win double digits, not just over 500, yeah. but double digits. Yeah, there's like a 14-year run or something, Bull, where a fourth-place team has come to first in the NFL, and that's the nature of it, right? Yeah. So that happens this year, and it's Washington or the Giants, we're stunt, right? It's right. the Denver Broncos, we're stunt. Yeah. But when it happens in the AFC North, like – any team is 7 to 11 wins, and they might all four be right there again, right. you know? Yeah. The Ravens are a lesser team. Lesser yeah. on personnel, lesser on coaching. They're still darn good, right? Yeah. The Bengals are going to be better, mm-hmm. um, and, and the Steelers and Browns are, are there. They've made their moves. They were playoff teams. The Steelers might be a ton better on offense. Yeah. I, people were downplaying the Russell Wilson. I don't As flawed as Russell Wilson might be, he's way better than what they had. Kenny Pickett did not belong on the field against of the Browns last not. year. Yeah. Russell Wilson cooked the Browns. Zach, yeah, exactly. w- what's a more realistic outcome? The Steelers win the AFC North or the Ravens finish in last? <laughs> uh, that, I think they're both semi-realistic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they, they are. They could finish in any order. I think the Steelers could win the AFC North. I, I think they could. I, I think if they get the kind of quarterback play, just average plus, mm-hmm. and they solidify their lines – which they've been known to do over a 50-year yeah. period, right? Decent then, track record. Yeah. They draft seven defensive tackles <laughs> in linemen, linebackers yeah. this week. Is it, yeah. Yeah. Hey, George, George, P- George Pickens is it's high stuck. ceiling. He's high volatility, but he's yeah. high ceiling. And if you get him on the same page with the play caller and the guy yeah. throwing him the passes, why couldn't he take off yeah. and be one of the top guys? And they'll probably draft a receiver in the second round and he'll end up being a good player. All right, we got a, some sort of new game. Or I don't know if it's new, but it's not a game. game. It's an exercise. And right. we have a read first. Yeah, I got to read Go real ahead. quick, guys, and then uh, McNuggets will run down how this works. But it's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 if you win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you guys waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right, explain this pyramid exercise there, Mike. So we had Hayden Groven last week, and when we bring guests in studio, sometimes we want to just do a traditional interview, which we just did with Zach for 15 minutes, but we're going to be for half an hour. Figure we have some fun, and, and we could call it a game. I just think it's more of an exercise. Yeah. So what we're going to do is a little homage to something Bill Simmons did on his podcast a couple weeks ago, and he made – a pyramid of the best receivers in football to find out where Stephon Diggs ranked on his quote-unquote pyramid to see if he was right. worth the, the value that the Texans yeah. gave up for him. So I said, okay, we're not going to rank the best receivers. We're going to project the best seasons that Browns will have in 2024, but put them in a period format so we could tweet it out as a graphic later. Okay. That makes sense. So the pyramid is more for the graphic format So afterwards. who's going to be the Browns' best player, and then the next is two? The- Two, two and players, three. and then yes. So you can and call it tiers. You can call it pyramid. Pyramid just looks easier on a graphic. So okay. what we're doing, this has nothing to do with past. We are projecting the best seasons yeah. for 2024. Well, it has something to do with past because that's going to well, factor but, into yes, your but decision. Yes, but I'm saying but, just because you had a good season last year, right. we don't expect them to have the same. And we'll discuss. We'll come okay. to a conclusion, and we'll move on. But there is one player in the top tier. All right. Two players in the second, three in the third, four in the fourth, and five in the fifth. Fifteen players total. Top 15, Brown. Gee, I have a feeling you didn't look at this at all last night when we sent to run that out because <laughs> yeah. you look very confused Zach, by the did top. did you know this was coming? I did. Yes, I, I texted did. Zach. I got we, coached up. We went, yes. Right. So, I mean, at one, there's no, is it just Miles Garrett? Is there any debate? I had Miles Garrett as my number well, one. Well, that's just an easy one. I think there could be debate, <clears throat> but, I mean, I think he's in his own galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could be debate because, as Mike said, you got it's got to look at – Look forward, just because he was the best player last year. Who? Okay, so we're going to agree on that and just move on? Miles was my number one, and yes. I had him a tier above everyone else regardless. Well, so I have yes. one question. Go ahead. Are we picking individual offensive linemen, or are we saying the offensive I linemen? picked individual offensive linemen for a few of them. Okay. Guys. Wow. <laughs> Wow! Yeah, that gets I pretty did. far. All in the right, race. I'm gonna go so, with Miles Garrett because he can he can he can pop off 15 or 17 like yeah. it ain't nothing sacks. So yeah, I mean Miles Garrett. So we are consensus. Miles Garrett yeah. will have the I best. I think if Nick Chubb had been fully healthy, it could have been an interesting debate. But but you got to consider sure. that sure fully healthy. All right, so tier two. We need. Are we separate? Are we just picking the two guys? Or are we saying he's two, he's three? I just put two guys for tier okay, two. Okay, so two guys in tier two. You want, Zach, you want to start? I'm gonna trust Denzel Ward. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I just I think he is really an elite corner, and um, he's never missed more than four games in a season, even though people call him injury prone. Yeah. I think the short scheme really allowed him to take off, you know, last year. Uh, he missed some time early in the summer, but I think once he found himself, I think that was the best version of Denzel Ward, and I yeah. really think the best version of Denzel Ward is nearly as good as anybody. Real quick, Zach, I, I'm curious. 
what tier does Deshaun Watson have to be on yeah. for the Browns to be legitimate? Not playoffs, because they're a playoff contender. You're you, you, you messing the game up, boy. No, no. The game up? no, because we'll get to Deshaun when he falls in here, but I'm curious what Zach thinks <laughs> on I'm that curious. Yeah, yeah. Tier, what tier, What's the minimum tier you think he has to be on for them to be a legit Super Bowl contender? Minimum third. Minimum I agree third. with that. Yeah. He's got to be a top six player right. on the Browns. Right. We're not talking about 10 and 7. Right, we're talking right. about we're talking about Super Bowl. Yeah. beating yes. the Chiefs. Yes, I mean that's the that's the bar. Sure, can you beat the Chiefs? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. minimum third. Yeah, I agree with that. So, I agree. All right, so Denzel Ward on tier two. I agree with Denzel Ward. Anybody anti Denzel Ward? I had him on tier three of my list. He's on tier three. Now I had my two tier two guys. Yeah. For almost the exact same reason Zach presented for Denzel, I had yeah. JOK. I got him. Now JOK two. had a tremendous <clears throat> season last yeah. year. I think in another year under Jim Schwartz. I have no reason to believe he will regress back to the player we saw in the first two seasons of his career. Yeah. And I think with a Jordan Hicks next to him as well, an upgrade at the other linebacker to his left and right, depending on the formation, right. he will continue to ascend. I thought he was right on the all-pro level in his third season, in a contract yeah. year, playing for more money. I think JOK is due for a monster season. I had Denzel as my first guy in Tier 3 behind. So who's your other Tier 2 guy? Wyatt Teller, who I am penciling uh, in as my all-pro left guard next season. You almost had him, McNuggets. You almost had him. <laughs> Drop the ball. Well, you didn't finish your breakfast. We're, we're going to debate here. So, JOK, you, you agreed with who was your, your Listen, other guy. JOK, you had that right. Mm-hmm. I think you might even see people talk about JOK possibly being one of the best. De- mentioned with Miles Garrett as the best defender on the team. Mm-hmm. I think his tackles for loss. I think he's going to only continue to get better. And I'm just going to double down. Deshaun Watson is on tier two. He's on tier two. 4,500 good news for the Browns. You got to have it. You got to have it. I can't I can't do it no more tier two. We can't put him on tier three. I can't keep putting defensive players over you. We need that Deshaun Watson at least bare minimum like 4,000 yards. We need it. But do you you believe he's going to be one of the three best players if he's throwing right now? I I got it. I'm, I'm marking it down. Who are your two guys? Bro? I had I had JOK also, but I had Denzel Ward and not Deshaun Watson. So then those are the two guys. Well, wait, both... Zach didn't have oh, Zach, second who's your guy. second who's your second guy? Well, I, I would consider JOK there, but here's why I would put Denzel clearly ahead of him. And this is probably more for what the Browns need than, mm-hmm. in reality. But did you see how the other two corners played in the in the playoff game? Yeah. Well, it was not great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Yes. Yeah. 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 Smoked. Well, that for be... one in particular that was very uncharacteristic. Yes. Yeah. But like Denzel is what makes this yes. secondary so well, we, have, we have two guys in tier two so you have Denzel who be your other vote for the second guy you put in tier two um, I'm, I would probably lean JOK slightly over Amari Cooper then those are those yeah, are we, two, the tier rest two of us guys. didn't even consider Amari I'm a little worried about Amari Cooper's age at this point a little Do we bit. want to lock in Denzel Ward and JOK, JOK those are Denzel our two, our two tier two guys yeah which brings us to tier three bull do you want to start we'll go reverse order this time uh so I, I've been going back and forth on Deshaun Watson between Tier 3 and Tier 4, and I, I want him to be Tier 3. So I'll be a little optimistic about this, and I'll put Deshaun Watson in Tier 3. Ah, look at you trying to be somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have Amari Cooper in Tier 3. Yeah. And I have Joel Batonio in Tier 3. Ahead of Wyatt Teller. You, but I do. I know Teller was better last He's year, better but, I think, but I thought Batonio played his best football the second half of the season. And so I, I'm going to have Batonio ahead this year, even though he's older. Gee, you're three tier three guys. I got Denzel, obviously. Um, and then uh, we got Denzel. We're going to go with David and Joku. Well, good one. And um, this is crazy. It's kind of crazy. I got Jerry Judy in the third one. Ahead of Amari Cooper? I think they're going to throw him Ahead the ball. Ahead of Amari? I think Amari, wow. Cooper, I think Amari Cooper might miss a Bold. few games next year, maybe Could three happen. or four. And Deshaun Watson has not d- developed a go-to guy. If he catches the ball early, he might spoon feed him just the same way Flacco loved David and Joku. Okay. Chemistry like that. I'm going to go with the, the sneaker and Judy. So I'm with you both on two of the three guys. Or on one of the guys, but you mentioned Deshaun, three, four. I have him in Tier 4. I can be talked in a Tier 3. Yeah. I think it's real close, but the three guys I had listed on my Tier 3 were Amari, Denzel, which have already gotten named, yeah. and then Njoku, who had a monster second half of the season. Right. I think in this new offense, which we don't exactly know what it'll look like, I can't imagine you have Ken Dorsey, Tommy Reese, Deuce Staley, Kevin Stefanski, all these minds coming together, seeing what David Njoku did in the second half of last season, seeing how important he was, not only as a blocker, but as a receiver and not trying to make him some kind of focal point in this offense, especially with Nick Chubb on injury watch until we know when he's actually coming back. Those are my three guys. 
I could be talked into Deshaun over at David and Joku if Zach wants to make the case for that. Right. Yeah, so I, I definitely would have. If JOK is in two, I definitely have to go with Mario to start a three. Okay. Um, I will say Njoku too. I, I, I finally have seen the leap. I was a non believer for a long time, and yeah, I was right. Yeah. Right? But I, I finally saw him put it together for multiple games yeah. for, for doing the little things right. Um, and then, you know, you want it to be the quarterback. I think it's Dalvin Tomlinson. I, oh. I think he was so important oh. the way he just held down the anchor inside there. They went from having the worst defensive tackle group in the league to Dalvin being there every single game and right. playing his butt off every single game. So what y'all, so say, so what y'all saying, we, they not – because you said Deshaun got to be in the top three for them to be – Yeah. Three out of the four don't have him in there. No. no oh, it's two. Two, 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 two. two and two. So I have, so he's my first guy in tier so, four, so he's just under. So Amari – and Njoku are definitely in tier three. The third one is between Batonio, Tomlinson, Watson. Well, I had Wyatt Teller in tier two, so he's got to be but in he there. he had least. Watson in tier two, and nobody I know, else I, had Teller. So I think Watson goes into tier three. I think Watson by Agnes score spot. gets the last yeah. spot in tier three. All right, let's all hope that's true. <laughs> yeah. Top six. Okay. That's not so, far. And once again, I had him as my first guy in tier four. Yeah. So, I mean, flipping one spot is is right online. All that's, right, so, that's our top six guys. So, so let's, not, let's not name... At this point, let's not name guys that are already on the board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's name the guys who are. So that's our tier. So Miles, Watson, JOK. And Joku Cooper. I can't. And Ward. And Denzel Ward. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Bull's not good with initials. Yeah, I'm not good. All right. So so guys. When we tweet out this graphic later, we're going to put headshots. Yeah. But for the sake of Anthony updating this live. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So tier four, who's. So we got our top six players off the board. Who makes up the rest of the top ten for you, Zach? Well, I think both guards there, you yep. know, and, and then Dalvin Tomlinson, who, yep. who I picked there, is for sure. Yeah. Uh, then it gets interesting. Is it Grant Delpit? Is it Jerry Judy? Is it Martin, Martin Emerson? It's certainly for me. So yep. how many guys? Four, four guys going? Four, four guys. Four guys. Yeah. So I'm gonna so go both guards, guards, Tomlinson and Martin Emerson. So yeah. I'll go Teller, who I obviously already mentioned. I had Emerson in this tier too. I think he is a bona fide, could be number one corner on half yep. the teams in football. He just happens to be a number two here because of Denzel Ward. I also put Joel Batonio, so both guards. And I had Dustin Hopkins as my last guy in Tier mm. 4. A mm. guy that Bull always likes to pronounce his name wrong. We do our drafts on yeah. Fridays during football season. But he was an all-pro caliber kicker last season. How do you pronounce Dustin Hopkins wrong? Yes. No, no, Bull, Bull does. <laughs> what did I call him? It's like 17 different names when we were drafting. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's not that like I pronounced it wrong. I think I kept he just, forgetting, he just kept his forgetting name. the name. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. but he was so good last but season. Kickers are unreliable from year to year. Most guys. I'm in. I'm all in. All right, I'm all ahead. in on him. I, I, I'm gonna go with the two guards, Emerson, and then this dude is forgotten a little bit because he got injured, but he got that money last year. I'm gonna go with Grant Delpit. Nobody, none of you guys mentioned Nick Chubb. I guess it's the injury. I had, I had Chubb in five. I, you know, I feel like I'm missing something with Dalvin Tomlinson. I had him in a little lower, but, like, Zach knows the team better than I do. So, I'm like, should I have picked Dalvin Tomlinson? But the guys who I had for Tier 4, both guards. Well, now that Petonio's been pushed yeah. down. Uh, both guards, uh, Emerson, and I'm putting Nick Chubb in Tier 4. Because I think he'll, I think once he comes back, he's going to be great again, eventually. How many games do you think Nick Chubb plays in 2024? Well, it, that's a good question. I don't have an exact answer. I think it, the answer can be eight or ten and be fine for the Browns. Like right. if, if he comes back and yeah. is Nick Chubb by game three. Yes. And, and look, I'm clearly no doctor, but if there's one guy that can come back from this, That's it's right. Nick Chubb. Zero right. maintenance, That's all right. work, and just freakish strength. Right. You know, before he got hurt, his combo of the breakaway burst and the power was like unmatched. unmatched. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the guards both get in, and Emerson and Emerson gets locked in. in. We got so it's one down more. to the last spot between Tomlinson. I said Delvin, but he probably. I think it's got to be Tomlinson because Zach initially had, had him in tier three. So, so I think Tomlinson, Tomlinson should be in. I think we're all missing the boat on Tomlinson. So can I ask Zach a question real quick on Tomlinson? Because cool. I didn't have him in my next tier either. I'll be honest. And I thought I had him in tier. I had him in the fifth. I had him in my honorable mention list. Yeah. You see him up close and personal more. Obviously, the defensive line, especially the interior, took a giant jump from 2022 mm-hmm. to 2023. There's not a lot of stats for those guys either. No, but just you seeing, you being at every game, seeing him way more than we do. We don't, we're not even at training camp because we're obviously here during the show. What does he bring that doesn't necessarily show up in the stat sheet that we, not be, we may not be able to quantify without seeing it in person? Why is JOK flying around? Well, JOK is really good, but he's eating up those blocks. He's, he's holding down the point there and allowing Schwartz to mix and match the, the pass rushers and allowing JOK to fly around. Allowing Grant Delpit yeah. to take his chances. That, yeah. That's what he's doing. Then Tomlinson's the pick. All right, so, so, so there we go. So we got so now the five, now guys eleven through Last fifteen. Five. Yep. 
All right. Do you want to let G go first? Yeah, G He's go the first, first one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, listen, this is the group of people that if they ball out or play above their grade, Browns can end up in the Super Bowl. I'm going to go with Nick Chubb, come back, get some get some wreck. Okay. All right. So that we got him out of here. Zadarius Smith. Listen, bro. I was trying to get 10 sacks from you last year. He didn't give it to me, Zach. He didn't give me what I wanted. If he could get it off off what he was doing and, and be healthy, I like that pick. I'm gonna go with this. I'm gonna go with this guy. I had Delpit in another one. I'm gonna have Grant Delpit in this this one. You got paid last year, Grant, but you gotta be healthy. Yep. Four, Greg Newsom. Way too. You be listen. You got you got the skill set. We know what you can do. But here's the thing. You gotta be able to be more consistent. Don't be trailing people. Know what you're doing. If he turns into, you know, one of those corners, he can, they can have their own little no-fly zone like they had in, in Denver. And then, so that's what, four? That's four. You got one more. And then I got one more. Um, I'm going to go with, this is, we haven't mentioned Big Fella. Uh, let, let, let's go with uh, Jedrick Wills. Hey, Jed. Mm. I you, think there's another offensive one. Hey, Jed. I, he, come I on. Have, I have a name on mine. Yeah. So, the five I had for tier five. Yeah. Chubb. Yes. Mm-hmm. Jerry Judy. Yes. Yeah, okay. Who you mentioned earlier, you G. Mentioned him earlier. Yeah. Now he slid down. Dewan Jones, okay. who I think is crucial to the Browns' success this season. Will he be a starter? I hope so. I don't okay. know how you bring him back off the bench. I had Delpit, and I actually had Alex Wright over Zadarius Smith. I am probably a little too high on Alex Wright as a prospect. I think what I saw at the end of last season has a chance to be exactly what you want, opposite of Miles Garrett. I know they brought back Zadarius, so he may not get the snaps he needs, but. I think Alex Wright, when it's all said and done, will be the Browns' second-leading sack, sack guy in 2024. Zach, who's your five in the next group? Well, it's not Alex Wright. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I like the Zadarius. T- I mean, I yeah. think when you look at Zadarius and Oboe, they're different players. They're asked to do different things. But you're right, Garrett. If, if one of those guys pops 10, 11, 12 sacks and, and Miles still plays the whole season, that probably yeah. means that they went crazy, right? Um, and I like the Newsom thought, too, because behind Chubb, he's probably on the one that maybe you're uncertain about, but yeah. has to be, right? right? He's playing for a lot of money. He's playing inside and outside, right? He's a guy that they drafted in the first round. They want him to be here. They want him to play better than he did last year. Yeah. They need that there. So, yeah, Delpit's there. Chubb's there. Newsom's there. Judy? Then you start debating. I, I don't know. I, I need to see it from Jerry Judy before Fair. I believe it. Um, you know, you start debating which, which offensive lineman is it. I mean, it's Jed Wells, same deal, playing yeah. for money. Has Could to be do it. Too. I, I was going to mention Pochich is one of my guys. Yeah. He's played very well for the Browns for two years. So I have uh, Nick Chubb. I do have Jerry Judy. I'm going to be optimistic that he's a top 15 player, even though he certainly hasn't proven it. Uh, I got Pochich on the list. I got Delpit on the list. And I forgot my 15th guy. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. I can't think of Well, that means Chubb, Judy, and Delpit for sure locked in. Okay, right. Those three. Okay, so, so I, now. Zadarius we, Smith. Zadarius Smith. Outweighs my Alex Wright, so Alex Wright. Newsom. Uh, sorry. Newsom. All Newsom. three of the other offensive linemen got mentioned once. Newsom. Right. I think Newsom got mentioned yeah, twice. Yeah, so let's so lock Newsom's in Newsom. In there. So the last spot has got to be one of the three other offensive linemen. Or Zadarius Smith. Or Zadarius Smith, yeah. No. no. What mentioned. about your kicker? You didn't make a case for him again. You had him way earlier. I, I did, but I feel like just like. No offense. Like, I, Dustin Hopkins had a great year, but he if he sucked this year, it wouldn't surprise me. Like. Kickers can be like that, unless, except for a few guys. I'd be, but he's not a young guy. Like he, and you're right, it does happen. But he wasn't that good before last year. But sometimes you put it together and you found something. It could be. And I just, but whatever. But I'll, I'll, I'll drop Dustin Hopkins. Year. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying it could. I'll I mean, drop Alex Wright. You got K York though. He's still bad. <laughs> Dewan, Zach, <laughs> if, if, the, if the choices for you were Dewan, Pochich, and Jed Wills, three offensive linemen for one spot. Who do you think will have the best or season? Or Zedarius? Well, I think well, just, saying, oh, between, between just between those three, three offensive lines. I think line. Jed is playing most? for the most mm-hmm. and plays the most premium position, you know, as, as the blindside guy there. Uh, we haven't seen it from Jed, quite frankly. Nope. You know, Zadarius is the most proven of those guys, no Without doubt. doubt yeah. uh, been a really good player for a long time. And, you know, I think it says a lot that they brought him back because they said this is not Clowney. 
where we knew we stayed, we right, stayed right, one. Right, right, like, right. He, his sack numbers weren't huge, but he was a good citizen. He was available every game, and we right. want him there. They look and say, finally, they've built to the point where they can say, we're not just projecting. This is how we want to play. Right, we want right. Darius to play here yeah. on this down, here on this down. Obo plays this role. Then Alex Wright fills in. Like, that's what they want. And, and the fact that they made another two-year commitment to Zedarius, even though they could get out if it doesn't go sure. well, like says that they're counting on a big year from him. You're two under Schwartz. Is there uh, is there more that they can get out of those guys? Because they play very well year one. Yeah, no, they should be. But but Garrett, they also just when you know show the playoff game, it's like what's going on. You're right. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. And they and let's be honest. After the Niners game, I was like, I'm not doubting this defense. This defense is that good. It can carry you in many ways. It did. It wasn't but after that. The numbers are skewed. Here's the backups they beat the crap out of, and here's how they performed on the road and against good quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. And there is a wide yeah. wide gap in right. there. I, I think Zadarius feels like the, the choice it feels for the like last five. The most consensus, because yeah. G mentioned him, Zach mentioned him, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I don't think we're going to find a true consensus no, on the So let's go with so, Zadarius Smith to round out There you go. 15. That's the list. You want to read it for us, Bull? Let's see if you no. can figure out the All right, initials. let's see if I can read oh, it. Right, right, right. <laughs> Miles Garrett, tier one. De- I keep wanting to say Watson. De- Denzel Ward, JOK, round, uh, tier two. Tier three is Najoku, Deshaun Watson, and AC Green. Amari Cooper. Amari okay, Cooper. Right, right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm lost now. This feels like a... Dalvin Tom... Tier 4. Dalvin Tomlinson. Uh... Martin Emerson. Martin. <laughs> Wyatt Teller and Joe Batonio. Nice. Yeah, and yeah. And the last tier is Nick Chubb, Jerry Judy. Good thing it's not Grant John Grant Delpit, Johnson. Greg Newsom, and Zadarius Smith. That is kind of hard. It should be a ZS. Yeah, it should be a ZS, and. <laughs> Not ZD. Oh, my bad. When okay. we tweet this out, Ant's going to put the headshots yeah. there instead of the initials. Pause. But, I wish uh, some of the honorable mentions. By the way, uh, there would have been many, 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 many years in the last 25 years where we couldn't even think of 15 decent players on this hey, team, they're, they're, let they're, alone be leaving good players out. The question, the, the question mark tier, Elijah Moore, <laughs> uh, Jack Conklin, Juan Thornhill, <laughs> What's up, bro? I had we did not see mention. you nowhere on the triangle. No pyramid, Juan. No What's mentions. Cool? No mention. Um, it, it, Cedric Tillman. Well, he's not. I mean, I, I mean, this is projection, it, well, so maybe. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. But he's going to have to question, jump three I mean, other I, I, I mean, the, the best guy. honorable mentions are probably the offensive line. Juan Jones and Pochich. Mm-hmm. Like, those guys were good last year. Yeah. And Pochich has been good for two Hopkins. years. I'm going to put Hopkins I would in put at least him now. If, if you're going to put Hopkins, you can put the punter, too. Borges mm-hmm. was great last year. So you, you guys are telling me you have no – I don't care about Jerome Ford. <laughs> you, you think he's not going to do nothing. What do you think about Jerome Ford? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah. I mean, I think he's a good player. Yeah. I, I think they saw they don't want him as their every down back, right. but that's fine, too. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, he has a receiver background. He has he didn't have much return background, but they thought he was explosive enough to do that. The touchdown he scored against Tennessee last year, he was lined up at receiver. Mm-hmm. So I think they see him as a piece they can move around. Yeah. Um, they bring in Hines, who's been a good player, but he's also coming off an ACL. Yep. You know, Foreman's been that short yardage back on like six different teams. So yep. I don't know how that goes, but I think Jerome Ford's another one. Like he could be, a, he right. could end up having a really good year. Yeah. We just don't know exactly what the role is going to be. Right. Or like in week four, are we asking Jerome Ford for 20 touches or is Nick Chubb back? Yeah. Right. You know, right. is, yeah, is someone else just doing it then and, yeah. and, and Ford's playing 8, 10, 12 snaps? Right. We, we don't know that. Yeah. I've seen mocks where they had the Browns taking a running back. Is that crazy? We had a guy, no. real quick, we had Kyle Krabs on yesterday who's a draft, a draft guy. And we have Dane Brugler from The Athletic coming on Monday. We'll ask him again. And he said all these running backs are on one-year deals. Like, all of them. Or not one-year deals, but Chubb's coming in the last year. Ford would be the only one. Ford's the only one who's not. Yeah. Foreman's on a one-year deal. Hines on a one-year deal. Pierre Strong, probably a practice squad guy. So, at some point, if you draft a running back, it's more. You're not going to get Pierre Strong yeah. in a practice squad. He's the best special teams player you have. Yeah. So you're not going to no. get him to the practice squad. But you're you're trying to Will accumulate he be on the good players. Man roster, you think? Yes, you're trying to accumulate good players and worry about the 53 later. But yeah. even if Pierre Strong never carries it, he's he's arguably your best special teams player. It was a really good trade last year. Interesting. Um, he is so fast. They're I, actually <laughs> Ruler's mock that came out today. Yeah. Takes Pierre's another guy from Pierre's College, at seventh round running back Isaiah Davis. I like Has Pierre the Strong. Taken him? Has the Browns taken it? Yes. I'm just, I it just, I, it, it seems like they can never get him the carries. I was waiting last year to see if he can get some some carries or something. I like his running, uh, uh, like his style. It just, I don't know if they just want to use him on special teams. It never just quite. I worked think out. they might take Audric Estime from Notre Dame, who played for Tommy Reese, who's a big, just big like guy. battering ram yeah. type guy. I, okay. That's a name I would look look at. Oh, wow. And if they go, what what wide? Re- if they do go wide receiver in that range in the second round, and could you see them trading up? 
No, I don't see them trading up at okay. all. I think most likely they trade down at a fourth rounder and yeah, then yeah, go yeah. about their draft. Okay. Yeah. Well, so what are the wide receivers in that range that you like? Um, the kid from Western Kentucky, Malachi Corley, who's not like a traditional wide receiver. Mm-hmm. He's built like a running back. He can play the slot. Like okay. very poor man's Debo Samuel, mm-hmm. right? Let's let's let him play in the NFL before we make that comparison. Right. Um, Poverty line Debo. <laughs> <laughs> On the current Browns wide receiver group, how many of the how many of the Browns' current wide receivers will be on this roster in 2025? Yeah, that's a great question. Amari's in the last year of his deal. Uh, Elijah Moore's in the last year of his deal. Yeah. David Bell's on a rookie minimum, so if you right. moved on from him, it wouldn't cost you anything. Right. So that's that's a good question. I mean, we have no. Reason. I mean, listen. Yeah. By, by what he's done, that. Amari yeah. should get extended. Yeah. By Amari looking at what Jerry Judy got, he should say extend me. But the right. fact is, this is year ten and age yeah. thirty season, yeah. and it's probably not good business to extend. Yeah. And that's that's the rub when you yeah. get here, and especially when you have paid everybody in the locker room. That's where the dynamic comes in. Yeah. How much hope do you have for Cedric Tillman taking a leap? Man. The size makes him different. I don't have any hope outside of that. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I've seen uh, it's hard for rookies. Yeah. And, like, he's not just a big receiver. Like, he's a big, big wide right, receiver. Right, right, right. So, like, he can throw blocks and ma- potentially make red zone catches that other guys can't. He did. We, well, he had a nice, he had a nice block uh, uh, in, uh, in Baltimore. In Baltimore. Yeah. He tattooed and that guy. We referenced yeah. it before, but we didn't ask you. If DeWan and Conklin are both healthy, what do they do? Yeah, that's a big, big if. if. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know. Conklin's only got guaranteed money for one more year, so yeah. I think DeWan starts Week One, and then we see what happens from yeah. there. Because I think you can kind of couch that as we're not going to push Jack back. We know Jack can play. Oh yeah, that's a nice. I like that. You good? I like that. I like how you, that propaganda is great. You can tell he be writing. Yeah, we're gonna push you. I've listened to a lot of also. coaches BS for a lot of years. Yeah. You know, Kong didn't even start last year, or was that two seasons ago when he came back? Two seasons two ago. Yeah, right, right. yeah he, he. They just they let him just kind of hang out and right. go through the motions the first few weeks, and then they got a full season out of him. So I still don't understand why they gave him an extension. Uh-huh. They were getting ahead of the market. It was the same thing as Jerry Judy. They were yeah. they were saying we want to reward our own guy, and they do love him as a person and a player. Yeah. But you know, we're talking about a second major knee injury on an older player. Well, so. that, that's the risk with all those deals. I mean, if it hits, it's genius. That's right. And if yeah. it doesn't, it looks terrible, and it's really hard to get yeah. out of without some serious. I, I agree that Dewan has a high ceiling, but we a knee injury on a guy that size is, right. yeah, is tough. scary. You worry yeah. about him. It's tough, and it's scary going yeah, for yeah, the future yeah. too. Yes. Yeah. Great stuff, Zach. Thanks for coming to the no, studio. No problem, guys. Appreciate yeah, it, Zach. I have him back on more. What's right. going on, man? Steve, <laughs> what's up, man? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, guys, before we get into the Cavs here, we want to thank Zach for coming in. And We just did. I want you all to come on a journey with me for this <laughs> next read. We've all been there, either as a player or as a fan, and when Bull laughs at you. But it's halftime, and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, and you're not sure your team can pull out the win. That's when you dig deep, you lift your head up, and you say to yourself, Time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heist, and take as much of my friends' money as I possibly can. That's right, the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches in the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone, anytime, with tons of new twists, including leaderboards, to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, charge other players for rent on your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments get extra rewards and climb the leaderboards. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now. It's free on the App Store and Google Play. Uh, Before we talk Cavs, real quick, the NBA has leveled a lifetime ban on Jonte Porter for gambling on his own games. We talked about that story a couple weeks ago. I was not here for that. Where he was... Uh, he was the most gambled on guy. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. The, with the he's a he's Michael Porter Jr.'s younger brother. Right. He plays for the Toronto Raptors. He's like their ninth, their ninth or tenth guy on the bench. Yep. And two separate times this season, on FanDuel, mm. he was the single most bet on player in the entire NBA, Ooh. and the unders in both of those games hit. So they had launched an investigation, wow. and according to Woj, a few minutes ago, he has been leveled a lifetime ban per the statement from the league, quote, yeah. the league's investigation found that prior to the Raptors' March 20th game, Porter disclosed confidential information about his own health status to an individual he knew to be an NBA better, another yeah. individual with whom Porter associated with and knew to be an NBA better, subsequently placed an $80,000 parlay wow. on his under props with the online sports Why book to win. Why would they even have an under props on him? $1.1 million, dollars, chart, my, my. wagering that, because you could bet on anybody and literally anything so. now. 
In addition, from January through March of 2024, while traveling with the Raptors or their G League affiliate, Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games using an affiliate's online account. These bets ranged in size from $15 to $22,000. The total payouts of these bets was $76,000. Uh, none of the bets ever involved the game in which he played. What a Lifetime dumbass. ban. Good. Yeah. Lifetime ban. Dang, bro. Um, yeah, like you, you. Hey, man, some somebody, some guys got to. Don't you got some parents? Like, didn't did your parents tell you, bro? You got a brother that's making two hundred seventy million dollars. That's like, crazy. Like, that's, yeah. Think about that. And like, and you're making a million dollars in the NBA. Your yeah. brother, you, listen. Like, I don't know what. Like, you got to think about it like this. If my if, if I'm rich and I got that much money, I'm not rich. And everybody on the payroll. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's on the payroll. That, why would he? Why are you gambling, bro? That's crazy. Know. Your brother's rich. I, it doesn't make any sense. It, Some people are stupid. If you want to gamble on the Cavs Magic series, though, the yeah. Cavs are minus 195 to win the series. The Magic plus 146 on the FanDuel. S- are the Cavs the smallest favorite? I do not know that off the top okay. of my head. The dates and times have been announced both. I got it right here. Game these. one. Is Saturday at 1 p.m. I knew I'm that was ex- you knew it was gonna that. be an early game. Hey, love that. That's I'm perfect. excited. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, I'm excited for all this. There all you that. Go. You know what? The, game you know, two is. Uh, go, 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 go ahead. Game go two. Ahead. Sorry. Game two is Monday. Right. Yep. Monday. Game three. Thursday. Game, game four, four. Sunday sat- or Saturday. Oh, Saturday. Saturday. Game five. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter at that point. But the the, the game time 1 p.m. for game one, 7 p.m. for two and three, and then the the set the other the second Saturday game. Is uh, a 1 p.m. game, which too. is phenomenal, and so the two middle go. games are on NBA TV. I will say this, man, and, and you know, you let me get that camera, man. Listen, it's something about competition, man. And, you know, we talk about the Cavs and and what they're gonna be long term, and whether Mobley's gonna turn into a unicorn. All that stuff stops when the playoffs get here, right? We always we say it. Everybody say it. We don't care what they do. Right. It's about these playoffs. Now go win. Now. I'm, we locked in. We watching. Like, don't, like, all the rest of that, I don't even remember what happened yesterday. Like, none of that matters when you get to the playoffs. That, that's what, you, you are in the tournament. Regular season NBA sucks. Playoffs NBA is, is great. great. Let's so, go. So, so, yeah, we may have been down on the Cavs. We may have been down on what they look like during the year, but when these playoffs come, it's about getting behind your squad because there's nothing like a playoff atmosphere. It's now time to show Darius Garland. Who cares if you was playing like garbage during the regular season? You got a chance to right the ship. Donovan Mitchell, yeah, you was hurt. You got a chance. Evan Mobley, y'all got an opportunity to come out here and win a playoff series, and I don't care what nobody say. If they come out here and win a series against the, the, the Magic, and get an opportunity to play the Celtics. You think eight people ain't gonna be behind them? Yeah, we'd yeah. be excited. That would. Yeah, be we're gonna be excited. Yeah, we're I, gonna be as excited. Down as I am, I know I'm very Shoot. down on the team, and I'm not. I think they're gonna lose the series. But if they play well and win this series, I'm, I'm gonna be excited. Yeah. And, and a chance to play the Celtics, who have clearly been the best team in yeah. basketball. If they can be competitive with them, I'm not gonna. Nobody's gonna expect them to win that series. But it'll be exciting, and they'd have nothing to lose in that yeah. series. They, I almost like it. The guard, the Cavs ain't supposed to win, right? They ain't supposed to come in well, here. Supposed to win and, the first round, right? We, but look, I'm even looking at them like this: if a win, a, a first round playoff win is a first round playoff win. It is. Now you playing the Celtics and you ain't supposed to win that game. That's house money, right? Donovan Mitchell, come, bro. It's time to turn up. Yeah. If you want to be known as one of those guys, the cool thing about it is, I know for a fact Donovan Mitchell can get seventy. I didn't seen it. I didn't see Karis LeVert get 50. I didn't see Darius Garland get 50, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like I didn't see uh, uh, Jared Allen get 20 and 20. It ain't like the Cavs don't have no talent. It's just about putting it together. So we may be down on them, but make no bones about it. G. Bush is all, I'm, I'm, I'm tuned in to every game. I'm going to be rooting hard. And if they play bad, <laughs> I'm going to be emotional. And yeah. if they play well, I'm still going to be emotional. I know the question Ant wanted to ask for this specific topic today is who should start at the three? Max Struess or mm. Isaac Okoro? Mm. So, G, mm. after that diatribe, <laughs> you just change the books. <laughs> who do you think should start at the three? Um, Struess here, this or is, Isaac? This is very tough. So, here's the way I want to do it. I was going back and forth. This is the part of the rundown I did look at. 
The last thing. <laughs> the last <it>. thing. <laughs> hey, I said, look, I want to come out, and I like, I, I like the fact is, is when it is, is either or. With Struess, it gives you an opportunity to spread the floor. And you need that with Darius Garland. You don't want things to be packed up. You want them to be able to drive and kick and do that, uh, especially when you got the two bigs on the floor. Max Struess has also been showing he's a playmaker a little bit too these last couple of games. Mm-hmm. But for me, I'm going to have to go with Isaac Okoro, and here's the reason why. I'm going to go with Isaac Okoro because he's able to, to erase the mismatch that you may have with Darius Garland. I just think about it like this. If they're going to run pick and roll or they want to blitz and stuff, they're going to have Darius Garland out there, right? They're going to make sure that they're going to put him in, in all of the ISOs and do whatever they want to. But it's not that bad if you got two rim protectors and Isaac Okoro who can guard the best team's other player. Uh, you know, I think that he's going to be able to kick up a, a little intensity. He's going to be, uh, be able to switch off on different people. And Isaac this year has shown he can hit that corner three. So for me, I'm going to go defense early. Uh, and I use Struis coming off the bench with Karis LeVert. Uh, George Niang, now I got a, a, a nice nice roster where guys can hit threes. But I'm going to go with Isaac and Coral because of his defensive presence. I love G's energy right now. The interesting thing, though, is he couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> and I agree the with you, Bo. The answer is Max <laughs> Struess. Yes. First of all, Max Struess played in the NBA Finals last year. Facts. All right? He was part of a team. We talked about, well, uh, nobody's expecting the Cavs to do anything. Well, nobody expected the Heat. I know the Heat are different because they've been good in the past. They were still the eight seed. Nobody, yeah, they were the eight seed. Nobody had them going to the finals last year, even though we know they're well coached. And here's the thing. Last year going into the playoffs, we had more confidence in the, uh, confidence in the team. We all thought, or maybe Jay didn't, the rest of us all thought the Cavs would beat the Knicks. Mm-hmm. And obviously they played terribly. Yeah, Jay and in that series, it was like, they're going to play defense. This, this, this. Forget that nonsense. You've got to score. Yeah. Okay, the Cavs got to score. They got to put up a ton of points. And Max, I, I have zero faith right now in Isaac Okoro on the offensive end. Mm-hmm. I want Max, Max Struth, Max Struess is playing with a lot of confidence. One of the few guys I feel like have played with confidence down the stretch. He was fired up in those last games. He was pissed off that they lost that game. Like, that's yeah. my guy. I like he's got the energy right now. And I want that energy in the starting lineup. I don't want to have a starting lineup. Where I have three guys that can't shoot. That's the big one right there, bro. I, I can't that's, do that. That's the big thing. I got to score. Let's go right off the bat. Last year when the Cavs lost to the Knicks in the playoffs, it wasn't their defense. They actually held New York to eight points below their season average in terms of points per game. They just couldn't score the ball. Right. And at the end of the day in the playoffs, you have to be able to make shots. Now, Isaac Okoro took a giant step forward as an offensive player. He shot a career high from three, 39.1%. He was 40% on catch and shoot threes. Those are all numbers that in the regular season you absolutely could live with right. from an Isaac Okoro. The question is now, can he make it in the playoffs when the lights are brighter? Last year against New York in the postseason, didn't go so well for him. Scared or to shoot? anyone else on the Cavs. Yeah. We have to see if he will make and take those shots against Orlando. You don't have that issue with Max Struess. You know he's capable of taking, making, because in the first round, uh, he's just waking up. Miami's used to playing deep into the Eastern Conference playoffs. He was a starter on a finals team last year. You hit the big part of this, though. As good as Isaac has been against Paolo Bancaro, and Ant, pull up 208 when you get a chance. He's been the single best primary defender against Bancaro in the entire NBA this season. In their three matchups, he held Paolo as the primary defender. He was 2 of 10 shooting, 6 points. He got a steal off him. Mm. You can't do much better than that. But if you play Isaac on the floor with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, you have no spacing to operate with. Right. And Orlando's defense, they finished with the third best defensive rating in the entire NBA, 110.3. You're going to ask Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell, who will be the two shortest players on the court, to go in and attack against Jalen Suggs, who's a terrific primary on-ball defender, uh, Jonathan Isaac, who might be the single best defensive player in the league, and three other guys who are 6'8 or above. And there's just not space to operate. You're going to struggle so mightily to score against half-court sets if you have three non-shooters on the court. So what I would do is I'm starting Struess, but my first rotation, whether it's at the six-minute mark, the seven-minute mark, whatever JB wants to do, when you take Mobley out or you take Allen out, it's usually Mobley's the first sub, it's Isaac who replaces him. And then you could keep the spacing because you still have Struess and Akur on the floor together. Okay. But that way you only have two non-shooters. And that's yeah. with the assumption if Isaac makes shots, it changes everything. But I just can't start a series right. and I can't start a rotation until I know Isaac will step up and take his here's, shots. Here's the thing. Yeah. These games are game to game. So sure. if, if you yeah. start Struess 
and you, Apollo Bancaro is killing him, you may have to say, well, listen, I yeah. got to sacrifice something. Yeah. If, if either Mo, and he has to be ready to do this too. If Allen or Mobley ain't getting it done. Yes. Yes. He he has to immediately be like, oh, no, no, we can't do that. Right. Uh, we, we One of y'all got to sit and come yeah. off the bench. Yep. And listen, it's the playoffs. You can get it off. I can understand it during the season. But you got to be willing to pivot between a couple. And you might even need to. And, and if you if you still are stagnant and, and Struis isn't making shots, you may need to actually start Karis LeVert. You I may mean, need to go. You may need to go a lot of different routes to get it done. I mean, Jay, let's face it. JB is not an idiot. He knows his job's on the line. It's going to it's going to take a I mean, I don't know if he can save his job unless he beat the Celtics in the second round. I mean, even a first round, round win over the magic might not be enough to save his job. Mm-hmm. What has he got to lose? Nothing. Like he he can't be worried about players feeling no. for the future. No. He's no. got to do whatever it takes to try to win. And, and by the way, I think what's as equally or actually maybe more interesting than who starts at that position who closes. is who closes. Yeah, that's, because, that's the and I thing. think it depends if you're winning. If yeah. you're winning, then I want a Coro out there. If I'm losing, I want Struis out there. And also by the closing minutes, we will have a very good feel of, okay, is Max, is, is his shot's going down. Right, right, right. At that point, Isaac will have played 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. Is he confident enough to step up right, and take right, those right. shots? So you have more information. It'll just be interesting to see how they start and kind of match up. Because I assume if it is Max, which he had his first career triple-double in the regular season finale, he's had nine or more assists in three of his last seven games. His playmaking been, yeah. has stepped up to a level I didn't frankly think was in his game. Yeah, right. He's also done a really good job rebounding. I think rebounding this year is going to play a huge role in who comes out on top. Yeah. But in theory, Evan Mobley has the physical tools to match up with Paolo. Like, that's not necessarily... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And you would think, I mean, he finished second in NBA Defensive Player of the Year voting last season. This is a guy who, on paper, should be able to keep Paolo in check. That's right. Didn't have tremendous success this year in the games. Paolo had 42 in the first contest. It was a bunch of different defenders. He was making everything. But Paolo's a guy who's going to get his shots. He's got to contest. He's 6'10", strong, athletic, crafty. Like, he's yeah. going to get his open looks. He's crafty. You I'm just have strong? to make sure there's a hand <laughs> in his face. Boy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's, is it he's crafty or she's crafty? I think it's, it's she's crafty. She's yeah. crafty, crafty, yeah. Now, I, I, listen, the most, I, I think three or the most four important guys mentally – yeah, the Morris thing is going to come into into play. Uh, having Morris and all that playoff experience, and he's a goon. Love it. You're going to lean a lot on George Niang. He's also a soft goon. He and he he's he's the soft he's, he's he's the Pillsbury goon. Like he's not really rough on the outside, <laughs> but he talk a good game. Max Struess, you talk about with Miami. Yeah. Um, been there, been to the finals, and then you got Donovan Mitchell. So yeah. those four guys, I expect. To, to pull guys close. If Darius Garland yeah. gets spaced out, yeah, if Jared sure. Allen is getting down on himself because yeah. he missed a rebound, or if Evan Mobley don't want to shoot the ball when he's open and you need him to, I think those four guys will, will have a lot more to say. Yeah. Last year against the Knicks, they didn't have those voices except well, for Donovan. Yeah, yeah, those point. other three voices yeah. now are going to be like, hold on, guys. This well, is not what point. we do. You want to talk about playoff experience, yeah. by the way, and this was something that killed the Cavs last season. Danny Cunningham tweeted this out this morning. Orlando's roster has total 91 playoff games. That's all of them. Right, and right. Joe Ingles, who doesn't play a ton, mm-hmm. has about half of those games. Mm-hmm. Cleveland's roster has 359 playoff games of experience now. Right. You could also say some of that's Tristan Thompson, who's not going to be a huge factor, mm-hmm. Marcus Morris. Right. You take some of those guys out, you're looking at essentially Joe Ingles outside of Orlando, nobody. Yeah. The Cavs without Tristan Thompson and Marcus Morris, well, now you still have George Niang. Uh, Max Struess and Donovan Mitchell, who yeah. all have legitimate, legitimate, legitimate playoff experience. And, right. and it's going to be so important when they get out, they need to bury them. Like, I was watching the old Cavs and watching LeBron, and one thing that they did very well is in the first quarter, the Cavs will come out during their, their 20, what, I think 14 to 2018 run. Yeah. They bury you, they'd hit threes, they'd finish you off early and make you look, you would be the more, when you got a young team like Orlando who ain't been there, they looking to find just any sort of, you know, good feelings. Hey, we, we were in it. The game is close at halftime. Then it's anybody's game in the second half. Yeah. If you come out there and you put the, the, the bricks on them, I want to see which one of these dudes is going is going yeah. to be clutch. Which one of y'all yeah. going to be clutch and on the, the road? And the Cavs got to win both their home games. Yes, we need that. Series. Because then, then Orlando will lack some confidence going right, home. Right, right. But if it's 1-1 going to Orlando, the Cavs could be in yeah. trouble. Yeah, yeah. Orlando's not a pushover. Like, people no. keep penciling in Cleveland right. to round two, and I, 
I'm going to pick Cleveland to win the series, but Orlando presents a lot of the same challenges that they faced against New York last season in a little bit of a different fashion, but yeah. they are by no means a pushover. Real quick, we've talked baseball today. We've talked football. We've talked basketball. We've done apologies. It's been a great show. We have to wrap it up with the most important thing because – I'm thinking of this now that I mentioned the Beastie Boys. Who is the goat of white rappers? Is it the Beastie Boys? It's Eminem. Is it Eminem? It's Eminem. That's just not really a question. It's, it's Eminem. Eminem, yeah. Yeah, it's, Beastie Boys. It's got to be Eminem. Like the Beastie Boys? Uh, they're, they're Hall of Famers. They're, they're like, yeah. it's like, you know, I, I like, uh, who is, who's a good, really good player? Uh, I like James Worthy. Yeah. <laughs> He's not Magic or Kareem. Uh, Eminem's. Em, em, Eminem might be the best all-around rapper ever. Really? Like he's he is it, good. He's in a lot of people's top fives. Earl, is he in your top five? He's saying no. Earl, see, in the, they use they, they usually say when people say Eminem's in the top five, they be like Eminem can't be in the top five because people in the hood don't play Eminem. He's like, when was the last time you heard Eminem in a club? Mm-hmm. Do you have it? Are there any other good white rappers besides the Beastie Boys and Eminem? You don't Mac like MGK? Oh God, it MGK is. does not count. No, Mac is, Miller. Is he a rapper? Jack Harlow. Shout out to Mac. I'm Miller. just naming white rappers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. yeah Jack Harlow's an actor now, isn't he? He was in White Man Can't white Jump, Man but he's all, I mean, he's he a musician. Just something else, I think. I said. Uh, you got Logic. Um, I don't know any of these guys. You got uh, what, what, what's his name? White Iverson. Uh, Post Malone. Post Malone. Oh, he's a rapper. He's more R and B. He's more R. Yeah, he's. he's but got he did a start mix. with rap. I mean, you know, you got to. What about the Vanilla Ice? He getting in the mix? I forgot. Hey, hold on, hold on. I forgot about this Drake. Wow. (laughs) Overtime is next. (laughs) Peace.